Thank you for your pledge on Patreon. Christopher Doyle. Hey, yo, Flip. Yo. I'm going to put you on some fire, man. They got this new bed wash company. They got the lotion and the, the everything. What's their name? They got a recovery room. It's What's out- the name? Maestro's, Maestro's Classic. Gee, money's up front. I'll put, put, you, you, I'll put you on. I'll put you on. I'll put you on the Maestro's, sure? man. You forgot the way I brought you? You forgot where I brought you oh, up there? Oh, man. You forgot? You forgot man. about Ghost? Right, right. Who is what's his name? Ghost. You know who he cool, man. Yeah. Ghost is cool, man. Yo, make sure you get your Maestro's Classic Bed Care products yes. today at Target, CVS, mm-hmm. or go on maestrosclassic.com and use the promo code QUEENSFLIP to get 10% off. 10%? That's it? I thought, Ten- it, was, I thought it was free if you put your... Are you crazy? All right, I get it. Make sure you go there today. Log on. Maestro's with an S dot com. I'm from Queens. G-Money! Yo. What's up, man? What's poppin'? What's poppin'? How you doing? My little, little under the weather, but we here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I can see that, man. You don't feel good. I, I was sick all weekend, man. What you was doing? Um, got sick. You know. How? You putting your face where it don't belong? No. <laughs> huh? You don't get sick that way. What are you talking? Yes, you do. I mean. You get burnt. Nah, I'm not burnt, though. <laughs> I mean, you might have ate something that you wasn't supposed to eat. I'm a picky eater. Ah, uh, uh, see, you see what you try to me. Yeah. Everything is all right with you? Nah, I'm good, man. You know, you got the show must go on. You know what I'm saying? We got a lot of people that's, that's, that's watching our show and, you know, waiting for the next episode. You know what I'm saying? So, got to keep it going. Yeah, salute to you, man. I I, I ain't canceling no show I'm really sick, 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 sick. Like, respect, respect. Like four or five times sick. Right now, I'm like two times sick. <laughs> when they get to like four or five, then it's like, all right, flip, we gotta reschedule something. You know what I'm saying? I got you, I got you, I got you. But I'm cool, everything good, man. Feeling good, you know. How you doing? You all right? I'm okay, I'm okay, man. I'm just here, just uh hanging in there, man. Um, you know, just a lot going on, man. You know, getting ready for this next show we about to do. Yes. Um I see you here with Shatik the other day. Yes, 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 yes. Shout, shout out to Shatik. Shout out to Shatik. Shatik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to him. <coughs> um, you know, Shatik is definitely somebody that you know, we had a meeting and it went good. I seen a little. I seen a little clip of the video. I ain't watched the whole thing yet, but I saw a little clip. Yeah, I'm like, okay. And he had me. You know, he he schooled me on doing our new show that we plan on doing. Uh, yeah. We decided to call it FDS Live. You it's know good I mean? dude. I mean, he's been around for a minute. Been in the game for a minute. You know what I'm saying? One of the Queens OGs. Well, yeah. You know, he's all right. young OG, young because he's still young. You know what I'm saying? We, so we, he we, one we, of the young OGs. We definitely gonna get him up here. Okay. But you know, I'm excited about our our uh, our next guest. Mm-hmm. Man, what are you so tired for, man? Yeah, come on, man. Let me turn up say, real quick, man. I ain't say tired. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, wake up, wake up, man. Under the weather a little bit, I said. I ain't say well, tired. Wait, 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 uh, over the weather. All right. Over the rainbow. <laughs> you know about those type of songs, man. <laughs> Yo, I swear to God, you know every, like, theme song, every cartoon song, like, every, like, word for word, though. Yo. I don't know how. I was in the house just watching nothing but cartoons, man. Your childhood was pretty good. I don't know how you turned out the way you are oh, now. Oh, hell, whoa. <laughs> you being racist, bro? No, I'm just saying, like, you're, you're a wild boy. Like, the, the, the shows you used to watch when you are younger, I would think you'd be, like, more more chill, more relaxed. Like, you crazy, bro. You gonna watch a lot of cartoons growing up, no? <laughs> G-Money. Yo. Episode 147. Nigga, Nigga we, we made, made it. it. We got a special guest. Special guest. Um, shout out to Sarnetta. Shout out to Sarnetta you know, one time, yes. You know, introducing us to these gentlemen. Um, he sent me a link. And Sarnetta is on some BS, though. Oh, Let me get at him. Oh, my God. Him. I told him, give me some notes. He sent me a link. And I, <laughs> and I see a guy, you know, very mild-mannered, voice is very, very soothing. I'm like, what in the hell am I listening to? I fell asleep, woke up, fell back asleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, man, this guy is a slick guy, man. One of the voices, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of things going on, and I'm happy that Sonetta, you know, helped, you know, uh, put this together, man. You know, he called sure. me. He's like, yo, Flip, you got to get this, this guy on there. Mm. You know what I mean? But... Can we call you Professor Smalls? Is that what we call you? Or say yeah, your whole name. And, and no, people call me Professor Smalls. Round of applause for Pro- Professor Smalls, please. <laughs> Open up. That's not like you, man. Round of applause for Professor Smalls. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Smalls, welcome. Thank you, sir. And we got another guest. Now, it's hard to pronounce your name. <laughs> now, you said Tazariak. That's, that's fine. I say Tazariak. I don't put the E sound in it. Like okay. Tazariak. I just say Tazariak. But Tazar is fine. Tazar, that's Tazar. what most people say, Tazar Yak. Okay, now, real quick, mm-hmm. where does that name come from? That's a Hebrew word. It's, uh, the translation would be Castle or Stronghold, so in Hebrew, it's Tazar Yak. Tazar Yak. Yeah. 
Okay, well, welcome to Flip the Script. Thank you. Appreciate it. <coughs> Professor <coughs> Smalls, how are you? Yes, sir. I'm good. A lot of things going on. A lot of stuff going dropping on. Dropping documentaries, day, man, huh? Mm. I'm telling you. Um, we got some words for you in a little bit, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I got some words for you because, you know, I, like I said, I was um, I was on YouTube and I was listening, and I said, man, this man he talks about Malcolm, and you know, and he talks about the family, but he never gets into too much detail. Then this documentary <laughs> came out, "Who Killed Malcolm X," mm. and one thing you did say in one of your uh, speeches is that you said that you knew that the uh, Louis Farrakhan had nothing to do with it because your guy's eyes was on him. That's what I heard. I don't know if you were talking about it, but you said you guys were on him, so you knew he had nothing to do with it. I don't know if you said him or Elijah Muhammad, but you said that you were on somebody. Yeah. Uh, on Minister Farrakhan, you know, a lot of people, when he came down from Boston that night, mm -hmm. a lot of things you don't do in detail because we're not just into this stuff ourselves. We got some enemies out here too, right? And they're always trying to exploit any avenue when it comes to us, one of the most powerful forces in the world is the group of people called the African Americans. There's no other group that the West is as afraid of as they are of us. We don't know that and we don't understand that, but they know that and they understand why they must be that. Um, so, you know, there's this documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? You know, I watched it last night. If it's okay to have a conversation on it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I watched the entire five hours. And, you know, for me, there's very little in it that was new, except the detail he gave on um, Brother Bradley mm -hmm. in Jersey. Some of that detail I did not know. Um, some of the FBI files I did not see. You know, I've seen most of the files on Malcolm. We were one of the first groups that were able to get that from the government. Um, but the pieces on the trial, the FBI documents, it is clear that J. Edgar Hoover ordered the hit on Malcolm. I mean, he says it. Do something about it. What do you think that means when the head of the FBI tells the field office, do something about this guy and who they've been keeping tabs on for nearly 15 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, Malcolm was at that point a bigger threat than Dr. King to the American government, you know? And, and why do you think that he was a bigger threat? Because he had an international understanding. He had an understanding of international politics. America at that time, 1963, 64, 65, America is trying, at, at that period, Asia and Africa is throwing off the yokes of colonialism. America and Russia is fighting on who's going to control those countries. It's going to be socialism. It's going to be democracy. Who's going to be? Who's going to win? What they were calling the Cold War, and America had presented herself as the the epitome of democracy and freedom and justice. Malcolm stepped in the middle of that and said, "Hold up, that's not true. They're hypocrites. They're liars. They're enslavers." They're murderers. They're committing a crime. Look at what's happening in Selma. They're blowing up our churches. They're lynching our people. They're putting our leaders in jail. They're raping our women. They're putting fire hoses on our people, et cetera. Malcolm brought that to the world. The world couldn't see that, you know? Malcolm went to African leaders who was beholden to the colonial powers for their freedom, and Malcolm says, no, you don't know what you're getting into. We live in it. Here's what it looks like. Mm. And it shook the relationship between Russia and the upcoming third world and America. America began to lose that battle. They began to slip from the voice of one man because not just that Malcolm was courageous, he was a man who had transformed to a truth being. This dude was real. See, the difference between most leaders and Malcolm, Malcolm became what he was teaching. He was very real. Mm. And so, and he was a Muslim. The majority of the people in Africa and what is called the Middle East and Asia are Muslims. So most of the countries that are getting freed are Muslim countries. Senegal is Muslim, Gambia is Muslim, Mali is Muslim, Chad is Muslim, Central African Republic is Muslim, Sudan is Muslim, part of Ethiopia is Muslim, Egypt is Muslim. This is where Malcolm is moving around. And they're loving him because he's this phenomena coming from America, the black Muslim, a people we didn't even know were there. We didn't know they had taken our people there. Here comes now this voice speaking against the most powerful nation on earth, 
pulling no punches to people who were shaking in their boots when white Americans walked into a boardroom or a conference room. And there's this one man saying, yo, you don't have to do that. You can stand up for truth, you can stand up for justice, you can stand, and you can speak truth to power, hmm. face to face, eye to eye. And his articulation was so extraordinary that people were listening, and he was changing minds, and America got frightened. And he didn't just start when he left the nation. Remember, he's, he's a calling out the CIA on the killing of Patrice Lumumba. And that whole statement, chickens coming home to roost, most people don't know what the statement means. You know, when Kennedy dies, he says there's a case of chickens coming home to roost. I thought it meant that um, what, what they've been doing, it came back right. home to him. Yeah, you're smart, but most people don't get it. When he says, oh. Chick, I'm an old farm boy myself, chickens coming home to roost don't make me sad, it makes me sad. Chickens always come back home at night. They go all over everybody's yard during the day, but at night, because I grew up on a farm in South Carolina, they come back home at night, so you've got to go close the coop, mm. right? So what he was saying, you were sending your assassins to kill other people. Those assassins, your assassins, have come back and killed their own president. Mm. He accused the CIA of yeah. killing the president of the United States. You know how powerful and scary that shit was? Because that's what he had done. He had accused the CIA of killing the president. Now we know they were involved in the killing of the president, but in 63, people weren't ready to hear that. Wait, hold on. What do you mean now we know? I, what are you talking about? Well, haven't you been watching the man. documentaries on Kennedy's assassination and the involvement, of the, man, on, the involvement of the FBI Don't and the involvement we. of the I CIA? No, okay. Don't say we. <laughs> right. You Stop gave me a watching. comment and said I'm smart, but I ain't know that. Well, the Stop CIA, the CIA and FBI and the involvement with the Cuban uh, uh, exiles who are a bunch of right-wing crazies who are part, wanted to overthrow uh, our brother Fidel. And, mm -hmm. and so when Kennedy messed up at the Bay of Pigs and didn't give them the, the cover they needed and air support, they felt that was the reason Castro wiped their behind. Now, Castro wasn't going to wipe them out anyway because you could not defeat that revolution. They haven't defeated it till this day. But then you were not going to defeat the Cuban army. I don't care what you threw on the shores. Okay. You talking about when they came on the beach on the shores? Um, really? Yeah, they and lost, the, pay, the Bay of that. Pigs. Yeah, Kennedy was supposed to give them air cover, but what I'm saying, the air cover wouldn't have done any good. But they felt because they didn't get that air cover, Kennedy betrayed them, and a lot was lost. And you got to remember, there's a La Costa Nostra involvement in this thing. There's a CIA involvement in this thing. There's the Cuban exile involvement in this thing. Uh, there's the 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 FBI involvement in this thing. And they felt their own president had betrayed him. So when Malcolm said that y'all send your hitmen to kill the Patrice the Mumbas and the other leaders, now those same hitmen that you sent out to the world have killed their own leader. Mm, See, I that's agree. what was the hot button piece that nobody ever talks about that. But what do you think chicken comes home coming home to roost mean? It means the people you sent out to do killing came back home and did kill him. Yeah, that's what I got from it. Yeah. Right? And but they because of Malcolm's ability to speak language and translate it into what he called making it plain, he frightened the hell out of them. And then he made, he was making relationships in the Arab world that had never existed before between African Americans and Arab Muslim world. Let you me know? ask you a question. <clears throat> it's just me on Malcolm real quick, and then mm -hmm. we're going to get to in a second real quick. Um, so you watch the documentary. Yes, sir. This is my problem. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to to Zari early about it. Mm -hmm. The fact is that it's a shame, but not a shame. We look up to Malcolm. Well, some of us, mm -hmm. you know. And when the, in the documentary, when they dis, when they found out the shotgun man, they mm -hmm. found him. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people in the, the area, in the Jersey area, whomever, even you know, people in the higher ups knew that mm -hmm. he did what he did. Mm -hmm. So my thing is like you know some people were fronting and acting like oh we love Malcolm and we gonna but the guy was right there in New Jersey opening up gyms. But he most up people, a gym. most people didn't know he was there. Now the people in Newark, but you remember Newark was a very big Muslim town, a very big nation town, and a very big Orthodox Muslim town. But most of the cats who were Orthodox Muslim came from the nation. Mm. All right. I only learned about this guy. Now, a lot of people, let me be clear on one thing now. 
there was a lot of people involved in that whole process. And most of them went to their maker shortly after Malcolm went to his. Okay, leave that there. Um, they, they talked about the leader of the mosque. What happened to him? You know? Oh, the See, guy with the glasses. Yeah. Yeah, somebody need to have a discussion about that. So. Wait, wait, hold on. What's his name again? Uh, James Shabazz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody told me he got his neck slit. Yeah, somebody said he lost his head. But there, there was a war going on. But see, there's two things happening. You and I know enough about the street, even though I'm an OG, I know enough about the street that when there's somebody out there in the street who is working for the man, people know he working for the man, but nobody mess with him, mm -hmm. you know, unless you hit some real power people. People know who the players for the feds is in our community. Certain people, if you're off in the street, and we know they're protected, so nobody mess with that because they know they can't fight what's protecting them. It is clear from watching the, the documentary last night and, and listening to the reading of the FBI files that this guy was one of theirs. This was their man, and they were protecting that man, you know. Now, how many more people were theirs that they were protecting, I don't know. But it's very clear from the, the information I saw last night that he was one of their protected persons. It came out only about five years ago that people started talking about him being possibly the shotgun man, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but that wasn't a public knowledge. That was a knowledge within the Muslim circles. And you saw many people. I saw some of my friends. I got a question a few of them. When the brother asked one of my comrades um, about him, and he said, no, don't talk about that. I got to give him a call tomorrow. <laughs> you know, Because he went to the funeral. He called me when he went to the funeral and told me, I'm going to the funeral, la da 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 and, you know, report back. My point, well, first, you know, we need to back up because nobody know who I am. You know, see, that's one of the problems when I talk, right? Yeah. But when Malcolm gets killed, I'm in the war, right? But I met Malcolm when I'm 16. And I come home a few months later, Malcolm is dead. Most of the brothers have abandoned ship. Everybody's talking about, oh, I was with Malcolm, I was with Liars, you know. You, weren't, you ran and you hid for years before you decided to come out and write a book or these other little things you're all doing. <laughs> well, I'm the guy that became the imam over the new mosque after his assassination. What, is, what does the imam mean? Imam means the spiritual leader, the preacher, the, the, the minister over the mosque. I am al Haj Amin Shahid, imam of the Muslim Mosque, Inc., the only imam since Malcolm X. Mm. Okay? I was also the bodyguard to his sister Ella for 18 years. That's the person who financed much of what Malcolm was doing. So I don't come out of the book, I could probably help to write the book at some point so that people understand, yes, I'm Professor Small. I taught at City College for 18, almost 20 years. I did that too. But my foundation is in Muslim Mosque, Inc. and OAAU. I was the liaison between OAAU, Black Panther Party, Asada Shakur, Zay Shakur, um, Matula Shakur, Lumumba Shakur. That's who I am. I'm Brother Small. Then that's what I was. I wasn't Professor Small, then I was Brother Small. So when I speak, at least you can know I got some foundation. Understood. You know what I'm saying? I got some foundation. And so it wasn't easy because many people on neither side, the nation nor on our side, wanted a war between black people. We all knew the feds had their filthy hands in there at some point. And if you heard my speeches over the years, I'm calling out CIA and FBI as being the killers of Malcolm X for decades. But most people kind of stay away from me because they figured that was kind of over the top. Mm -hmm. But I think after seeing this documentary last night, they're going to realize that wasn't that much over the top. Mm -hmm. Because when Malcolm came back on that last trip, he had a meeting at Ruby Dee's brother's house, Tom, out on Long Island. And at this meeting, all of the, the civil rights leaders, all of the primary organizations were present, except Dr. King, but Doc sent the representative. And they came up with a tentative agreement that they, they were going forward in some sort of working relationship between the OAU and these movements in terms of the struggle in America. That frightened Hoover, because the last thing Hoover want was a Malcolm running around the South with Dr. King in them. Fannie Lou Hamer had invited him to come and speak at her place in Mississippi two weeks following the date that he was assassination. 
assassinated. Other people, he had been to Selma shortly before that. And, you know, when Doc was in, Doc King was in jail, and he made it very clear to them, y'all better deal with him, because if you have to deal with me, you're going to have another problem. Mm. So the last thing they wanted was the fusion of the nationalist movement with the civil rights movement, with the articulator being a Malcolm X. So the feds were irritated and afraid on the home front, and they were irritated and afraid, afraid on the international front, because he's meeting with the Kwame Nkrumah, who is running Ghana and is not an American friend. He's meeting with um, Jomo Kenyatta, the Mau Mau leader in Kenya. He's meeting with Ezekwe, uh, the leader of Nigeria. He's meeting with Ahmed Ben Bella, who was one of the leaders of the Algerian revolution. And so they were saying, what the hell is going on? How is this guy able to create these relationships? And they were afraid of those relationships fusing with the African-American movement in this country, especially when he came back and tried to find some serious partnership with the civil rights movement. You know, even until Jimmy Carter, the fundamental policy of America is that there should be no economic, political, and cultural relationship between black Americans and black Africans. And the big new Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor on the, on the Carter, wrote a white paper on the subject and was very clear and spelled it out that it was a policy of the United States of America to make sure that African Americans and Africans never unite politically, yeah. economically, or culturally. Let me so. ask you a question. Sorry. <clears throat> Pardon me, G. Um, so I never really, with all due respect, I never heard about Malcolm X's sister. Mm -hmm. I don't know Ellen. why. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm amazed that, that, that nobody really talks about Ella. Without an Ella, you got no Malcolm. But hold up. We'll slow down, Professor. Back, let me you know, back going, it going, up. You're going kind of fast right now. I, I know. <laughs> you were 90 just now. Yeah. So, well, you can't say that because didn't the, uh, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, didn't Malcolm hear about him? While he was incarcerated, he heard about you know he heard about him, and then he went to go meet him. So where does his sister? I mean, his sister's in his life, of course, but where does his what does his sister got? That's to do his anything? mama. His mama's in 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 the mental hospital, incarcerated by the authorities because in those days they used mental hospitals as prisons, right? When they didn't have nothing they could convict you on in a the court, they convict you of being psychologically incompetent. And they can lock you up for longer periods. Mm. So his mama's there. Who does he go to live with in Boston as a teenager? That's Ella. Oh. But he wasn't just living in the house with Ella. And, and it's amazing people do these stories about Malcolm's family, and they leave out the significant element. Mm -hmm. This lady is one of the wealthier black women in Boston, right, at the time, in real estate. She's one of the most politically powerful in Boston. Matter of fact, she's the guy that take Tip O'Neill, the dog kitcher, catch and make him the city council person who then become the speaker of the House of the United States. But they're going to leave him out of it. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. this, this is the guy that gave the first senator from uh, uh, Boston the money to fly back to Italy and marry the woman who saved his life when his plane got shot down over Italy during the Second World War. So Ella is, is a phenomenon that they just leave out of history. So she's the one that raises Malcolm until he goes to jail, all right? But she isn't just there alone. Malcolm's got two auntie, Aunt Gracie and Aunt Sarah. His daddy's sister's living in that same house. Three three women create the man that you see, okay? Because if Elijah could make him, why didn't he make one of his sons? Well, hold on, hold on. Whoa, whoa. Uh, yo, whoa, just whoa, take whoa. it like it is. Slow down, man. Stop it. <laughs> He went to jail. So if, if that's the case, you got to say that she created him. To, he was stealing and robbing. You forgot that? And he was I, a pimp. You forgot that? I've been arrested a whole bunch of times, but I ain't never went to jail for no time. I was a good burglar. I got away with my burglary. He didn't get away with his. But you just said that she, so you trying to say that she. She, listen, the, the fact that you go to jail is no sign of being raised badly. Half of the country is criminals. They just don't go to jail. 
<laughs> and and, and oh, Malcolm man. went to oh, Malcolm didn't go to jail so much over that little burglary thing. He went to jail because he was going with these two white women. Two very wealthy, married, upper income white women, who the court tried to get to accuse him of rape. And the women refused to do it. Those crackers was pissed. Y'all ain't gonna call a rape down on them? They gave him the max for burglary that you usually got two years of walk on. So now when he, okay, so. Just want to get history straight now. No, no, get, some, let's get some, straight. Let's get and, straight. and then we told him a big time criminal. He goes to jail at age 20. How long was he out in the street? 18 to 20 months. Is that a big time criminal? No. Thank you. Study the history. Do the timeline. Do the math. But Malcolm pushed that piece because when he started writing his autobiography, he was still in the nation. And the autobiography was a book about redemption, that the nation can take you from the streets and raise you up to the height. And even when he was out of the nation, from what I understood, he told Alex Haley not to change the book because the idea was for so many of us who are in those kinds of crisis conditions in our inner city especially, he was showing that there's an instrument that can transform you and reform you. So he had to big up his criminal part. But how big was that criminal part? Just look at his own autobiography. He wasn't in Harlem that long. When he was coming in Harlem and hanging out, he was working for, for the, the, the Amtrak rail, whatever they call the railroad then. He was making good money if you're working as a waiter on a train. Okay? The New York was his end stop. And when he did get off in the street for a minute, he screwed up and had to get out of town like real quick. Thanks to his boy Bumpy Johnson. This is another story. No, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, what? Wait, hold on. Okay, time out. From what I understand from Bumpy Johnson's granddaughter Margaret, who wrote the script that you're now seeing as the Godfather of Harlem, right? She said Malcolm used to come over to the house almost every Sunday playing chess with Uncle, with her granddaddy Bumpy. Everybody know Bumpy and Malcolm was friends. The dude that schooled me when I got back home, my mentor was a cat called Sunni Malik. Mm -hmm. Now, Sunni Malik was the biggest gangster in Harlem at that time, not in terms of being over anything, but everybody understood when Sunni Malik walked, nobody talked. Now, Sunni would put you to sleep if there was a problem and somebody in the organization called him. Now, I love my mentor, so that's, the, that's all I'm going to say about him. He, he didn't make no bones about the fact that he was a hit man. People said, well, why are you praising him for being your teacher? Because he was my teacher. He showed me how to stay alive in Harlem. He protected me in Harlem. And anybody that know me and anybody knew SUNY, no, SUNY Malik, SUNY Carson, you couldn't, I couldn't be messed with like that. So you just look those brothers up as time. And that soon used to wear a ring on every finger back then. This dude used to wear lace suits. This is before hip-hop, right? He was just the hip-hop before hip-hop. He was one of the brothers that Bumpy put the um, cover down on Malcolm. Even after Malcolm tell Bumpy to pull your people off, because, you know, you're into the drug thing, and it ain't looking good that you're protecting me after he was out of the nation. The feds snatched him and two other brothers off the street two weeks before the hit went down on Malcolm, put him in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta without any charges, and released him two weeks after the assassination. What does that say to you? You know, for things that people don't know. But what I'm what I'm saying is this. You met Malcolm when you were sixteen, yes? Yeah. And uh where did you meet him at? On 141st Street and 8th Avenue in front of the food family supermarket, which is no longer there. I was a grocery packer. I was packing bags. I came up for the summer. I lived in South Carolina. I saw Malcolm on television. I asked my mom. My mom and pop lived up there on 115th between 7th and 8th Avenue. The mosque was 116th and Lenox. I told my mother about this man because I come out of a very active political family, and I was already active in sit-in and other things at home. And my mom brought me up for the summer to meet this man. We went to the mosque three times and I missed him. I even filled out my letter and sent it to Chicago to join. Um, then one day at the mosque, they told me and a brother named Dwight, Whitey, Dwight Green, that he was passing out flyers against the march on Washington. And it happened to be in front of the store where I was working for the summer packing groceries. In those days, you got paid to pack those bags and stuff. 
and I met him for about 15 minutes. I remember anything he said to us because I was so mesmerized by this extraordinary figure. The one thing I remember, I told him I was going to leave school in South Carolina, I was going to move up here and join the mosque, and he did a stop on that. He said education is one of the main things that's going to free our people. And I needed to stay in school, and I needed to get higher education, and then come back to my community and serve them. And so that's what I've tried to do with my life from that moment forward. Um, I never saw him again. I go home. I'm in, I'm in the reserve, naval reserves while I'm in high school. So I go home and think I'm Malcolm X. And though I had a full scholarship and um, a waiver to go to college, the crackers did a trick on me. And the day after I graduated, I had to report to the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. But then there was another white comrade of mine who was my commanding officer, got me out of the Navy after two months, and I attended school at Savannah State in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I didn't stay there very long, because um, when I report for duty at the Reserve Center, got to the door, did the salute, professor, uh, I wasn't professor then, seemed to friend a small reporting for duty first. The cracker said, nigga, what you doing here? I go like, oh, shit. In my little town, the reserve center was integrated, not in Savannah, Georgia. So there was an incident, and I got banged around a little bit, but I was cool. And the next month, I go to the reserve center, and they assign me sergeant at arms. That means an armed person to walk you to the bus stop to get back to the school. And there was another attempt to, to jump me by this group of little hoodlums, and somebody opened fire in the crowd. So I had to leave school right after that. So, you know, I was an angry black dude. I was the first one for my family to go to college. And now I'm kicked out of college on a football scholarship where I had made the third team. At any rate, I go in the military full time. Malcolm is killed while I'm in the military. My brother, who's a part of the OAU, sent me records, um, all of the clippings. And this is when I realized you know, I don't know politics really then. I'm a kid. I'm 18. I get this, all of these clippings. I make a, a portfolio, a big photo album. And then CID, a week after I'm showing it around, CID, that's the Navy Central Intelligence Division, go to my locker and take all of my stuff. I still didn't understand the ramifications of it. Mm -hmm. But I knew something different was going on. If you're going to steal newspaper clippings of the assassination of somebody. So when I get out of the military, I come home. A few months later, I go to the OAU, go to Malcolm's sister. Three weeks later, I'm her private bodyguard. Now, there's some family relationship that we ain't going to get into. Mm -hmm. But I'm the bodyguard for Ella Collins. I was chosen by her chief security. I moved from New York to Boston to take care of her both in our home and traveling on the highways. And then the rest really become history of my life. Six months later, I asked to reopen the Muslim Mosque, Inc. because all of the people who were there had left. And so they decided to have a vote. They brought in the leadership from both Sudan, the U.S., Saudi, and they elected. I was at that time the only elected imam in North America. And so I became the Imam of Muslim Mosque, Inc., and began to recruit the brothers who were coming back from NAM. And that's how we restructured OAU, restructured Muslim Mosque with soldiers. Um, you know. And um, what, what did you know about the relationship? What insight do you know about the relationship between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad? They were very close. I mean, that before the rip came they were like father and son but part of the problem is Elijah had a lot of sons and so now here's this outside brother comes in and you build up this extraordinarily close relationship with and he's your primary spokesperson for your organization a lot of envy and jealousy develop within the ranks of the leadership and especially in the ranks of the family Long before the chicken come home through speech, Malcolm was having issues in the nation, okay? So it wasn't just a rip because he disobeyed and made a speech. Malcolm wrote an article for the newspaper. He founded in his basement in Queens, Muhammad Speak. That's where the newspaper was founded. And he wrote an article every issue. But starting in June of 63, 
his articles was not appearing in the newspaper. He was so busy out here, he didn't pay attention until Ella called it to his attention. But by November, with the death of Kennedy, and he spoke after his leader told him not to comment and was suspended, only then did he begin to realize that some stuff, he knew stuff was going on because the messenger was not well during that period of time. And Malcolm would go and do a lot of his speaking for him. And then orders would come down from Chicago that, no, we don't want you to speak. We're going to send a member of the family. We're going to send one of the sons to speak. He was the national spokesperson, but the leadership was kind of marginalizing him. And then he stepped in it when he made that statement uh, at the death of Kennedy. And he was expelled, and that was the end of his relationship in the nation. I don't think the messenger did anything to kill him other than, you know, there's a riff going on in his arguments. We see this with Sonetta TV, you know what I'm saying? We see brothers and sisters arguing and going off over issues, and they're not in the same organization. Mm -hmm. We saw the same rip between Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. We saw the same rip between Du Bois and the Honorable Marcus Garvey. We saw the rift between Booker Washington and Monroe Trotter, and we didn't learn the lessons from history. And like many organizations in the nation, obviously didn't have a conflict resolution element so that when the crisis came, they could have mediated this conflict. And instead of causing all this pain that has occurred in the black community for 53 years, we might have gotten past the pain and produced something extraordinary in terms of those leaders in that relationship. But we didn't. And what we need to do is learn that lesson today. Because like that documentary, when I first heard of it, I was a little suspicious. Who killed Malcolm? Are they trying to rip open the wound again and have us fight each other again and have us ripping ourselves into pieces again? What is this documentary about? Thank God it wasn't about that. The young man seemed to have done an extraordinary job on research, an extraordinary job on even doing the kind of commentary he did in trying to show step by step what might have happened and who were the players? So the um, James Shabazz is was the head of Moss Twenty Five. Yes. Mm -hmm. What happened to him? From what I heard, he lost his head. When did you hear that? Years ago. So one day he ended up missing. I never keep <laughs> kept touch of him, but that's many many years ago. Yeah, there was a big yeah. there was a big riff. Yeah. Uh, you know, you remember the two community at that point was blaming each other. Mm -hmm. um, but let me say this. I, I learned a lot about the Newark situation. It was more intense than I thought. But I knew a lot about Newark because my teacher comes out of Newark, Camille Wadu, um, from the mosque there, and Hisham Jabba, mm -hmm. the brother who buried Malcolm. Because nobody would come forth to bury Malcolm. Everybody was scared. But a brother showed up tall, lanky, dark-skinned Muslim out of a mosque in Elizabeth, New Jersey named El Hajj Hisham Jabber. Okay? And he performed the Janaza for Malcolm. Um, and that was my teacher who taught me Islam along with another imam out of the Newark Orthodox community named Camille Wadu. Okay? It was a part of the Arabic or the ancient Arabic Muslim society. They went back before even the nation. Um, so people knew, but for a youngster like me who were was their student, a lot of information I didn't have access to. But they were people who was out there, and there was uh, warring going on trying to solve the problem of who killed Malcolm long before the, this peace. But what a lot of people did not want to look at is the role, and in many speeches over the decades, I've spoken about the role of the CIA and the FBI in the assassination of Malcolm. Those of us, Sonny Malik, other people, and I got to meet Mr. Bumpy Johnson, and we never had conversations about this because my sister was one of the biggest barmaids in Harlem, and Bumpy would only, when he, he came to the Rennie Lodge, only Viv could serve him. So I'm in, you know, when you're in the movement, in the nationalist movement, your natural partner was the black gangsters because nobody else wanted to have anything to do with you. And that's where you got your weapons. That's where you got your protection. Those are the bars you hung out in and so forth. And so 
we know that many of the people involved, because when you have something like that happen, they can say five people in, was in that ballroom. Mm -hmm. It might have been seven, really, when you give all the things that went on, the smoke bombs, the, the t four up front, et cetera. Um, but you know there's more people. It's not, nothing like that happens with just the cocoon. The cocoon may be the elite element of it. So a lot of people paid uh, a price for that. You know, you heard about Brother Leon Amir, who was from our side, was found dead in the hotel in Hartford during that period. And other people, a lot of people died around Malcolm's death. And on the international front, you had Mr. Cummings, the ambassador from Guyana, jumped out of his hotel window, they said. You had the brother from Kenya shot to death. All the people that was dealing with Malcolm internationally, most of them was killed within a month of Malcolm's death. So, but, Hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yeah, it's bigger than, than, than the brother focus on this piece, but it's bigger than that. That's why you know the feds. This who, was who, their hit. Who, who was the, you said you the, the Guyanese who? He was the Guyanese ambassador to the United Nations. I think his he name is Mr. Cummings. They, Mr. Cummings didn't jump out of no window. Somebody pushed him out of that window, you know. Um, really? You had uh, the, the the brother Malcolm was dealing with from Kenya. Um, I can't remember his name now. Age creeps upon you. But he was assassinated within three weeks of Malcolm's death. And a number of others. There's a, the, the, the San Francisco Chronicle did a piece with a name of, Everybody, this is back in 68, they did their piece on it. So I'll try to get that stuff and send it to you, you know. Okay. The, the killing, of, and there's a lot of good books out on this stuff. You know, Zach Kondo, you saw Zach in the piece last night. Mm -hmm. they bothered with, Zach did some good research. Um, there's a book called The Judas Factor, mm -hmm. which is another good book to get on Malcolm. Um, there's the, the, the Malcolm and Me from the Dead Level by Hakeem Jamal, which is another good book to read on Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And there's another one, The Life and Death of, Death of Malcolm X by Peter Goldman, which is another well-researched piece. There's a lot of information that people don't look at because they don't read the literature of the people who were trying to research this thing through the years. And, and you'll see that people were clear that our government, if they would kill Fred Hampton, they wouldn't kill Malcolm. We know they killed Dr. King, and they got away with that one. You know, they, they said Dr. I found out recently that that Dr. King's family sued the government and won. Yes, saying that they had. Uh, I found that out from uh, Al Abi. Yeah, they said Dr. King's family you know? sued. So if they would let's take Fred and Mark, if they would kill Fred and Mark for the work they were trying to do in Chicago, what wouldn't they do to Malcolm X, given what he was trying to do internationally and nationally? And it's clear in the literature the young man brought forth last night from the files of the FBI, Hitler gave, I call him Hitler, Hoover, gave the word, right? Do something about Malcolm X. What do you think he meant? Go have a conversation with him. When he said do something, that means handle that. And they did. So when you watch a documentary, right, and mm -hmm. the guy that they said it was a shotgun man, which his name was, you know, Bradley, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it strange that he passed away while the guy Ver was going to confront him? Very strange. Very strange. Um, and the photos you saw, him, the, the brother was healthy. He was strong, yeah, yeah. you know. And yeah, then when yeah. this guy get close, bang, <laughs> you know, he's gone. Yeah, that's crazy. Isn't yeah. that the craziest thing? And, but it's when you heard that piece where they said that no one could talk to him unless they deal with the Bureau, that was one of their peoples. That was one of their people, and if he was a hitman, he was a hitman for the feds. And we know how things go. He probably had a beef and had to make a deal from going to prison for a long time or doing their dirt. And we see that stuff all the time. That's true. You know, in the community. And, and it was happening back then, you know. The, the bottom line I would like to say to my people is let's not allow for our enemy to continue to divide us and to continue to rip open wounds in our community to keep us irritated about how to build our relationship one with the other. Mm. 
And until we can grow up and mature enough to realize we do have contradictions, we do have problems, it does cause crisis, but we have to sit down as a family and heal that thing and move forward for the freedom of the next generation. Because we live in these bodies a very short period of time. You know, my main thing is really spirituality, not politics. So, you know, living in bodies is just, my mama gave birth to herself and she gave birth to me. She gave birth to herself and my father. I am them in eternity moving forward. Mm. And so we only doing this experience for a short period of time. So we're living for the next generation. So let's try to bring peace in our community, build better relationships across the different religious group and black ethnic nations that we've developed in. And let's come up with the common front that Malcolm was talking about when he was talking about that black united front. And he was talking about black nationalism as being his political philosophy. Let's learn what that is. Um, real quick, what do you know about Marcus Garvey? Did a lot of people, you know, a lot of people really like Marcus Garvey? What did you know? Because the government, he, well, they tried to. The take, government destroyed that organization and destroyed that movement. Marcus Garvey, see, what we got to do again is stop letting white people give us our information. That's why I'm glad I'm down here with some African men who have a way to give information to our people mm -hmm. through a venue that you've created. Thank you. Marcus Garvey came here at the invitation of whom? Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. From but if you leave it to the white man, Booker T. is so marginalized, we don't even think about the brother. But, but mm -hmm. he brought Garvey here. Garvey wanted to come and teach at Tuskegee. There's a good book by Tyena Wright on Booker T. Washington, uh, the Pan-Africanist. And Garvey came here to meet with Booker. Booker. They were going to work together. But Booker dies mysteriously a few months before Garvey get here. Was that a federal hit? He had a beef with Monroe Trotter, another one of them beefs in the black community, mm -hmm. who was the New England radical. Booker come up to New York and had a meeting here in New York with some white folks, the so-called leftist friends of ours, our liberal friends, mm -hmm. Monroe Trotter, T. Thomas Fortune, W.B. Du Bois. He gets sick at the dinner table and never recovers. He goes to St. Luke's Hospital. When he realizes I'm dying, he sends a telegram to Tuskegee. His wife and his aide came to get him. He died on a train in the station in Baltimore, Maryland, trying to make it back to Tuskegee to see if he could save his life. And we don't ask a question about why he died because we don't know history, and we keep repeating the same mess over and over again. So by the time Gabi gets here, Booker is gone. But Gabi hooks up with all of Booker's people. T. Thomas Fortune, um, um, Henrietta Benton Davis, who's the, who's the number two woman, this black American woman at UNI, and people don't even know his name, her name. Mm -hmm. When Gabi go to jail, he leaves this woman in charge. And so Marcus Gabi said, according to Dr. Tony Martin, one of his biographers, that I've come to implement the Tuskegee model. But who makes that equation? Because we're busy dealing with the division. So we need to understand history so we can erase the mystery and get down to the truth of how to be black and successful. Garvey was one of the most successful organizers we've had in the black movement worldwide in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But the FBI infiltrated the organization using black FBI agents, both from the Caribbean and the United States, to undermine the UNIA and to eventually uh, destroyed the Black Star Line, and then getting uh, the Honorable Masai Marcus Gabi put in prison. Do you, you know, think that and he... And then deported from the country. Yeah, he was deported, right? And then he went, I think he passed away in London, they said. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, so Marcus Garvey, a lot of people, what did you think the people liked about him? Why did, pe why did he gain so much followers as such a, being from well, Jamaica and... Again, history is important to inform, Malcolm said history is important to inform our research. People were already organized when he got here. He just pulled them together. Oh. Guy who had his newspaper, T. Thomas Fortune, mm -hmm. right, was Booker T. Washington, Maine's man when it came to the press. He had the biggest black newspaper in New York, which was the biggest black newspaper in America at the time. So he becomes the head, the editor of Garvey's newspaper. Mm. Many of the other elements of the UNIA, another element, the woman, Henrietta Venton Davis, who was an elocutionist and a teacher, she was the protege, or her teacher was um, Frederick Douglass. She becomes the number two person in the UNIA. So T. Thomas Fortune 
was a part of an organization called the Afro-American League, formed in 1892, that morphed into the Niagara Movement that then became the NAACP. So black America is organized. Prince Hall Masons is the primary organizing instrument along with the AME Church. And these are the element that bonds with a Garvey and gives them the platform to move around America and organize its structure. Mm -hmm. And her number two woman or man or woman, Henrietta Benton Davis, speaks French, Spanish, and Portuguese and is able to help him organize Central America. So he came into a nation where people were already organized. Mm -hmm. You know, Monroe Trotter, McNeil Turner, um, Martin Delaney, all of these people leads up to him. And so he's able to pull these networks together. That's what's so extraordinary about Garvey. You so know? he just, he just, do you think he was just a good talker? He was a very good orator. He, he, him and Malcolm had that in common. They were extraordinary orators, brilliant intellectual political minds, and they understood the grassroots people. They understood the grassroots and they could speak to the grassroots. And then they both understood, you know, Malcolm, when Malcolm said he was a black nationalist, people said, what is black nationalism? He says, when you control the economic, politics, and culture where you live. What did Garvey do? organized the economic, politics, and culture where black people live. They opened businesses, they opened banks, they opened credit unions. Now, when Garvey got to the country, there was already at least 50 black insurance companies in this country. Mm. There was already something like 45 black banks and about 1,000 credit unions. But many of those people came together with him to come together in a unity in the UNIA. And if you watch them march down the street and you look at the uniform, you're looking at Prince Hall Masons, which already exists in America as the largest black organization and the oldest black organization in America. So that's why history helps erase the mystery. And like Malcolm said, good history informs your research. History helps you erase. <laughs> Not only helps you erase the mystery, but it allows you then to work your magic. Gotcha. You know. All right, so real quick, we're going we to switch gears and go to my man. Um, yes, sir. Zariat. Zariat, one time. So tell us your story real quick, man. Tell, tell us your background, your story. I, um, my name is Captain Cesariat Velaya. should be playing under uh, Commander Juliana. What we do is um, we give black people their identity from a biblical perspective. So our narrative is that we are the true children of Israel scattered through the four corners of the earth. So we go out on the street corners primarily or now that you have the internet and stuff like that, we can have online classes. Mm -hmm. And we try to redeem our people. Like if you look at black people in general, we're all looking for some form of spirituality, some escape from this reality, and how do we come together, so to speak. So everybody has had that Bible in their house their whole life. I'm pretty sure we all had mm -hmm. this Bible. I know me a little older, <coughs> my grandma used to have a big Bible in the living room Mm -hmm. sitting with her but nobody ever gave us the full understanding we always think of this white image of jesus christ this white image of jews this white image of god and so forth nobody bothered to open up the book and realize that it's a black history book specifically of the children of israel so we use that as our primary platform to uh teach to men black on black crime men black on black hatred um, so that's what we do on the street. So we do rehabilitation. We go to prisons. We have food programs. We do all those things for. Uh, it said you low. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> no, raise the mic up. Just raise the mic up a little bit. Yeah, just like that. Yeah, right. like, is that better? Yeah. Am I good now? Yeah, you said you were low. Okay, yeah. no problem. So we use that as our platform to uh, redeem, rehabilitate uh, the minds of black people, to show them what true brotherhood is. The one thing black people have uh, that they're lacking is compassion for each other. Right. That documentary. Uh, with the Malcolm X is the proof of it. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for them to even, if they had a difference where they had to be a part, that it had to lead to murder, that it had to lead to deceit, to envy, or any of that. So what we do is use the Bible. One of the things me and, J me and Professor Smalls was talking about in the car was that the Nation of Islam didn't have a plan to deal with um, issues among 
brothers. Yeah, conflict resolutions. You know, conflict resolutions. But the Bible provides that. So we you can have a council where two brothers can meet, and if they can't solve it amongst themselves, you can have a council where, like how y'all two are sitting up there, there'd be a third man, and then they can come there and they can work out them differences. If they can't solve it, then you can come amongst the congregation and then work out the differences. That's more so what black people need. Instead of the normal thing, you either shoot it, fight it out, or whatever, which is an endless... That's right. how you have bloods and crips and et cetera like that. So that's what we do. So real quick, talk about like what what made you get into this lifestyle, like what, what initiated this uh this lifestyle for you, you know? I um I remember in the nineties when the Malcolm X movie came out, I would have been a Muslim because like Denzel played the hell out of that role. <laughs> right, right, I mean, right. you know, by the time you know, Denzel yeah. is a dark skinned brother, you know, Malcolm light skinned, but right. by the end of Denzel the movie, you think that Denzel is Malcolm. <laughs> like you he looking just like him. And I used to listen to the Malcolm X tapes and everything like that. And so I was like, you know, that cat Sharif from Minister Society. That's what they used to call me because okay. I used to be on the corner. <laughs> but then as we hustling or smoking weed or something like that, I'm like, yo, we got to stop doing that. So I was kind of like that guy. And the only thing stopped me from being a Muslim was um, my mother raised me Christian. And so I leaned more towards that. Mm-hmm. And so as I got older, um, maybe about 2009 or something like that, um, I started seeing, I used to hear we were Israelites from uh, Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown. I used to hear about the brothers in Demona um, going over to Israel. So I used to hear about us being Israelite. And in 2009, I started um, seeing YouTube videos that we were the Israelites. And it started really piquing my interest. And so I started really studying and lining up with the scriptures, with history, with the narratives. And I found a school, uh, which is ISUBK, the school that I'm in now. Mm-hmm. And uh, once I... Uh, found that school, they pretty much taught me everything that I know. Is what made me what uh, me and Queens Flip was talking about coming in. The first thing I ever seen was them having a white man on their knees, kissing their boots. That's the first thing I ever seen. Wow. And once I saw that, I've been in the school ever since because I said anything that powerful. And they didn't do it like, come on, man, you don't want to just apologize. I mean, they was aggressive with it. Like, you know, get on your knees, you're going to pay for what your ancestors did. And that's what I've always felt in my spirit, that someone has to make America face the evil that they have done to blacks and Hispanics. Let me ask you a question. What about the fact that they said that black people sold black people to white people? Well, that doesn't negate. Okay, so now for, from a biblical perspective, um, we don't look at every black person as a black person. So you can have an African person and a black person. You can have an Arab person that is dark-skinned. You can have an East Indian that's dark-skinned. Mm-hmm. So your skin color doesn't make you who you are. Your nationality does. Okay. So for us, Africans so Israelites. That's how we look at it. That's the perspective that we come from, not just Africans versus Africans. And now let's say if it was Africans versus Africans, that still don't absolve America from the crimes that they did to mm-hmm. black people. But you wouldn't, and I, I can agree, I can see your point, but mm-hmm. you wouldn't hold the people or... I do. You hold them accountable yes, as well. Yes, I do. Did that. do it right, <laughs> which is why a lot of people look at it like we um, hate Africans, so to speak, right? So we have a reputation of this so-called hate of Africans, which is interesting. That never really came up as a dichotomy for us until black people that follow African spirituality started charging us for it. We were more so content with charging America for the crimes that they committed against us, not dealing with the African side of it. But if we're being honest, you have to charge them for what they did. You can't absolve them from selling us. Don't They wouldn't be able to. We would never be able to be enslaved if it wasn't for them selling us into slavery. So are we wrong for holding them to be accountable? And then there's never been a responsibility from their side that's been viable enough to say we can let that go when a crime is committed the only way that a victim can get over the crime is if there's a punishment to whoever committed the crime so we haven't been redeemed by america we have not been redeemed by africa we have not been redeemed by the arabs we have not been redeemed by any any of the nations that had a hand in our slavery that's why we suffer you take a rape victim the only way she can get over that rape is if her uh, predator goes to jail. When the Jewish man went into um, the, the so-called uh, Holocaust, 
when they talk about the Holocaust, they split Palestine in half because they couldn't leave them people in Germany to be with the Germans because the Germans are the one that oppressed them. But we have been forced to be around our rapists since we've been in America. Let me ask you a question. So what if it was your ancestors that sold some people? Would you hold them accountable as well? Yeah, we don't have respective persons. Uh, so a respective person would be somebody like if my mother, brother, somebody committed the crime, now I'm trying to let them slide because that's my mother, <laughs> brother, or whomever. You have to be accountable. The respective persons isn't just for leadership, it's for crimes, it's for everything. But what I'm saying though, and I, and I get it. I want to get. I want to ask you your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Smalls. But what I'm asking you though, is to say you're, you're, you're holding accountable. You're saying we got to hold Africans accountable as well. Yes. Every nation that had us in chains. And you, when you mean us, you mean blacks, Af like blacks as a whole, blacks so and you Hispanics that have been in slavery. So are you differentiating the Africans and black? Are you not differentiating them? I, I do. We do. Yo, come we on. Don't. Yo, Cesaro, chill out. Cesaro, you're fucking up. Cesaro, you're fucking up. I had to close the laptop. What in the world are you talking about? You, you serious? So who, yeah. who, was, who was the people you considering then? Like, okay, so like from a, okay, so from a historical perspective, when Israel fell as a state, you had one million Jews that fled into Africa. So for a time, we lived amongst Africans. And it wouldn't be, it, it wasn't like we saying we lived amongst Africans and there was like no getting along or no mixing or anything like that. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying is that the Israelites in Africa is a different race than the other races in Africa. And so what do you, what do you consider yourself as? An Israelite from the tribe of Judah. An Israelite. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. I see. So, so, so you don't consider all of us as one. I do consider all of us as one. But, but like, so we'll say like so-called Africans, because we don't look at blacks in America as all being African. We look at them as being Israelites. So sorry, are you dead serious too? Dead, I, dead ass serious. I can tell, and yeah. I, it's, can, can you understand how it can be a little confusing though? Because I, absolutely, because our whole life. But what nationality or identity have we ever had since we've been in America? We've been Afro, we've been Afro-American, Negro, Nigger. Whatever acronym. But that was what the white people gave us, yes? But what know? identity have we given ourselves? You got people call themselves Moors, Muslims, yes, that's Christians, true. That's true. Africans, Kemet. We got all these different nationalities. And that's if right. I was to say from a spiritual perspective, Deuteronomy 28 and 37 says, we'd be called a byword and a pry verb because we left our God. So because we don't have that identity, because we left our power, because we left our authority, that's why we don't have an identity that no one can really stand on. Even me saying that Israelite <laughs> brings war. Not not physical war, not brings that. spiritual war. Mm -hmm. Because we're so destroyed, because somebody's gonna say, nah, we're Nubians. Somebody's gonna say, nah, we're Commissions. Somebody's mm -hmm. gonna say, nah, we West Africans. We're the only people on the planet that don't have no identity, and that's biblical prophecy. And, but, and, and I'm gonna get to you, Professor. Give me two seconds. What, so, and this is all due respect. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> did you just check, spit it out? I'm listening. You, whatever uh, you got to say, did you come check on your with ancestry? Like how you? Oh, you just? Oh, you just, oh, you just pick Israel? <laughs> did you? I just, I'm coming for real. Man. It's crazy. No, I like you, man. No, nah, no, nah, that's, that's cool. I'm trying cool. to figure out how did you? How are you? Well, we go by. Okay, so now for Israelites, we go by the seed of your father. So whatever your father is, is what you are. So for example, we don't look at Bob Marley as a black man. That's an example. Because his father's a white guy. Wait, hold on. Wait, so first of all, you first of all, you gotta slow down when you talk about Bob, bro. Yeah, I know. That's a thing. That, that, but, but, I'm, down, not, I'm not saying, but, but, just Bob understand, alone, man. but just understand, I'm not saying that in a disrespectful manner, but he does have a white father, he correct? He does, but you think about... That so, was, are, so you are the. Strong, that's a strong. That's a strong comment to talk about Bob like that, bro. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna try try to think. Well, hold of on. Let's talk about Bob. So you you consider Bob a white man? Yes. 
Sorry, are you that serious? Like, for real, like, you would go on record and say you consider Bob Marley a white man. I think I just did. Because his father, no, I'm just trying to see if, I, oh. you, of course you did. I'm just trying to make yeah. sure. I have to ask questions twice. No, no, you, no problem, no problem. To, 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 to make and sure. I ain't saying in a disrespectful no, I don't way, think you are, but, but his father is a white guy, yes or no? Yes, his father okay, is Okay, now white. his mother's black. Now, he, of course, he gravitates to his mother's side of the family, mm -hmm. and I'm not taking away from any characteristics. His skin color mm -hmm. is of his mother's side of the family, mm -hmm. so I'm not taking away from that. But as far as who he is as a race or a man, he would be of his father. But now, let's talk about, so what about what he stands for? I'm not talking about. I'm not taking. That's why I said I'm not taking oh, yeah, away from that. him gravitating to his but that's mother's like side. Looking, that's how somebody looking at your, your skin tone and saying, "You, how, how did you get light skin well, like that?" That's a perfect example. Skin tone doesn't make you doesn't identify who you are. Your skin color, like we get caught up in colorism. That's something the white man created, where he create light skin and dark skin, where, or he'll say the natives to hate the blacks because mm -hmm. of the races. So he created colorism. So we hate light skin. There's light skin people in Africa right now. Everybody in Africa is not pitch black. They're not Wesley Snipes. You got Wesley Snipes, and you got me. But in hold Africa. on, but, but, but wait, but wait. Are, you, are you trying to say? Do you do? You, are you aware if you have any sort of white blood in you? Are you aware of that? On, I think um, down the line on my uh, mother's, on my grandmother's side, mm -hmm. not on my father's side, okay. but on my grandmother's side, there could be. Okay. So, but we would still go by the seed of your, your father, father, whatever oh, I your see father what you is. I see, I, see what you, I see what you did there. Hold on, Professor Smalls, what, what, what do you feel about what this man said? Can you... I ain't messing with his religion. Uh, oh. <laughs> but I am going to mess with the question of Africans selling Africans, because that needs the right context. What do you, well? Remember, history erases the mystery. Uh, <laughs> and you've got to study, because just as... Um, my brother is saying that the Hebrew Israelites who were driven out of Palestine, who came into Kemet and spent quite a time, they didn't just pass through Kemet. Right. This is after the exile, I keep mm -hmm. up this thing, that they come back into Kemet again and acculturated in there for many thousands of years. What's Kemet? But I'm sorry. That's Egypt. We're talking Egypt. about Egypt. Got it. So you've got to look back at the, the invasions of that area. First, you got to look at the Hyksos invasion. This is a Eurasian people. And, and then the Hittites. This is the first real crack of people. And then the Assyrians. Not the Assyrians we see in now, but the granddaddies. And then you have two Hittites invasion into Northeast Africa. I don't consider the Middle East to even exist. That's, that's a white man crazy because there's no Middle West, Middle South, or Middle North. Mm -hmm. So he cut off a piece of Northeast Africa to give himself a, a human genesis and call it the Middle East. All of that was the black land, all right? But over centuries, we get invaded, first by the Hyksos, then by the Hitt Hittites, then by the Hittites, wow. then by the Assyrians, then by the Assyrians, then by the Persians, then by the Persians, and then by the, Rome the Greeks, and then by the Romans, and then by their children, who we now call in the Arabs, and then the people from the Caucasus mountain, the Kurds, who we call the Turks. And they will hold uh, host over Islam, over, over Islam and much of Northeast Africa until the First World War. Mm -hmm. Okay? In the course of all of those warring, we're being pushed out of Northeast Africa. The people we call Egyptian is pushed to the West Africa. The people we call the Hebrews is pushed to the West Africa. I don't make the same racial distinction because I believe there's really only one race. White folks is in the same race I'm in. He's just a mutation off of the black stock, and he's the extreme mutated element. I mean, my thing with that is that they don't have the genetic capacity melanin-wise to contain spirituality, and that's why they got to deal with this whole concept <laughs> of intellectualism. But that's a whole nother lecture. But to come back to what's happening in Africa during this period, by the time 1492 occurs, there's already 1,500 years of Islamic, Arab, Turkish enslavement, and they put into place the slave system that the 1492, the Christopher Columbus people who follows him, mm -hmm. will feed onto and latch onto. That system is already in place. 
We are already being sold across the Sahara. We are already being sold into Europe. This is before anybody come to the Americas as slaves. We are already being sold over the Indian Ocean. We are already being sold into the so-called Middle East for 1,500 years. So a system is in place already. And many Africans was involved in that system. Most of them were Muslims because they were a part of the Arab conquests that controlled that system. And then the Turks, who takes over the system from the Arab at the end of the 8th century, or really, they really finally get it at the 10th century. But they began to take it away from the Arab in the 9th century. Okay, so the people we call an Arabs, they're not even Arabs either. That's a whole nother story um, about who they are. So mm -hmm. I want to get to this African selling Africans. So you got a war that's going on for 1,500 years all over West Africa. They call it the jihads, okay, meaning Muslim wars. And so by the time 1492 comes here and the Portuguese and the others coming, Africans are looking for another ally to fight this monster that's been killing them for 1,500 years. And so that's where you're going to see some of this conflict. So now the white folks coming in from the West say, okay, we'll give you some guns to fight them other folks who've been killing y'all. Mm -hmm. And then the prisoners of war get sold. The Hebrew Israelite community, who I recognize is there, but so is the Kemetic community and other community driven out of the Nile Valley. They're now in West Africa primarily as either refugees, because they're the recent arrival, recent meaning the last few hundred years. Okay, mm -hmm. And those recent arrivals are the ones who will end up suffering and getting put into the slave trade and the slave market. Mm -hmm. And then those who uh, engage in these internecine wars, which is being fed by the Turks and the Arabs as the Muslim side, who are now encountering the Western Christian side. And they're now selling guns and arms to one another. I'll help you fight that group if you help me get access to some gold and some other stuff. So there's wars going on for almost 2,000 years that feeds into what becomes the transatlantic slave trade. So it isn't just an easy discussion. And um, we don't have enough time, and I haven't discussed with my brother, and I never debate or argue with my brother when we get on a set like this because there are things he's got to teach me about the Hebrew Israelite community, even though I've worked in that community for decades myself. And I've studied it. I taught comparative religion for 18 years, you know. What does that mean? I mean, I looked and studied religions, and I taught it at City University as the primary teacher out of black studies, teaching the Hebrew tradition. But I always had a Hebrew, a black Hebrew rabbi at my side, helping team teach. Mm -hmm. I taught Islam. I had a Muslim <coughs> imam at my side. When I taught Japanese Shinto, I had a Japanese Shinto priest at my side. So I was probably one of the best teachers of, and had the largest class in City University. Mm. They had to stop my registration. They got too loud. But the point is, mm. a lot of what uh, the captain has given us is history. I just think it needs a little more detail so we can understand what happened in that process where they were Africans who were selling other Africans to Europeans, but they weren't selling them into chattel slavery because they didn't know what the heck chattel slavery was. Okay, they didn't even know where America was. And the servitude system in Africa had no resemblance to what we learned to know as the genocide called the transatlantic slave trade and chattel slavery. So those kinds of details we need to make sure we put into the equation so that we begin to understand relationships because the Hebrew Israelite community is only one African nation. There you have uh, the Kemetic, the, the Egyptian community, we call the Kemetic community. That's another nation. And that nation and the Hebrew nation had a conflict. That's how they end up in Israel. But they also have a book. You know, a lot of times we've been informed by the Bible and the Quran or the Torah in this culture. But there are other, um, there are other um, books. For instance, if I was to tell you I'm reading from an ancient uh, committee book, and it starts like this, the Genesis story. I created myself out of myself. And when I realized that existence exists, existing began to exist. And when I realized that I existed, this is God Amun speaking, when I realized that I existed, Ma'at 
was standing at my side. Truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, and reciprocity was symbolized by a woman, but there ain't no woman growing no bird wings, all right? That's the symbol of concepts, ideas, and principles. And he goes on to say, I create, I coughed up shoe, and I spat out tepnut, meaning the air and the moisture. Then he talks about he created the sky and the land and how to, those elements, he creates the human. Those stories aren't that far different from one another, okay? And, and yet most people over here, because this culture hadn't allowed us to really get to that literature, we don't know we have books older than the Torah, older than, 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 than the New Testament, older than the Quran. But there's only one story to be told in the universe. There's only one son. There's only one law. All right? The degree to which any culture has learned the laws and learned the sciences is the degree to which that culture has superiority over other cultures. One of the master things that the Hebrew community have over most people, they do have a literature that has a, a, um, a longevity and allows them to study and learn that literature, talking about their ancestry, and many other communities don't have that written literature. I'm a priest in the Yoruba tradition. We have a written literature, but most people over here are not a part of that written literature because it's in Yoruba, mm -hmm. you know? And so if I tell somebody I'm reciting a verse, but we don't call it verses, we call it odus. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know what an odu is. It's just a verse on the wisdom of the laws of nature or the laws of God or the laws of the divine as we see it. Oh. So, but I'm, yeah. what I'm saying in the end, there is all these different African nations. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew nation is one of those many nations, you know. And it's one of the powerful nations because it has survived for so long intact with its literature and with its rules. And they're scattered all over West Africa even now, you know. Just like many of the other nations are scattered over Africa. The Zulu used to live in Kenya, okay. But now they live in South Africa. What occurred there? You know, we got to study migrations and movements and crises and climate and other things that force us to move all around the continent. There was a time North America was smacked up against West Africa. They call that Pygia. Oh, what is that? Is that the right word? Pygia? Mm -hmm. And everybody didn't jump off on the African side when the continental drift occurred. Many of us stayed here, you know, and would be here when those new ones came on those ships. So there's a lot to be studied in our history and to understand a context on how to realize and accept one another's historical experience without having conflicts with one another. Mm -hmm. And that's been difficult for us because the white man has really confused us by cutting us off from access to knowledge of history. You know? If I can add one more thing yeah, to sure, the I slave, do, yeah. I appreciate it. Um, when we speak about the transatlantic slave trade, we also don't want to forget about our Hispanic brothers. That's our side, too. The transatlantic slave trade started with, from uh, America to Spain first before it came to Africa. When Columbus came over here, it wasn't happiness. He, took, he started off by taking 1,100 Taino Indians, today the Puerto Ricans. He took 1,100 over there, 300 survived. He said, that's good business. And so he was first transporting the Hispanic brothers, the native Indians, the Seminole Indians from here to Spain before mm -hmm. he began the uh, the slave trade from Africa. Right. So I just wanted to add that part in there too. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you feel about what, what he said, what Professor Small says? Do you, do you understand what he's saying? Yeah, I understand exactly what he's saying as far as the history. Like, you know, college, uh, Professor Smalls what is giving you a, not even as long as he could, but he's giving you a longer version of the history as far as the, tri the time from, he went far back as to the Hittites. Yeah, yeah cause I'm just our, saying that there's a lot of detail mm -hmm. right. that go so with he, right. um, so he, what that, the, the statements we make. Right. Then you gotta look at the details. So I was know? given a brief synopsis from 70 AD, our time in um, Western part of Africa up until the slave trade. So some of the stuff I agree with, some of the stuff you know, yeah. I disagree. Yeah, we have to sit at a table, yeah, but we, we do that at the kitchen table. Right, we would <laughs> have a conversation about yeah. that. So, wait, hold on. So what, what What? you don't agree with? I would have a conversation with uh, Professor Smalls. First. first. Right, yeah. before I would say it. 
publicly. Yeah, respect, here. I respect. Out of respect to Professor Smalls, I wouldn't. He's the here. man. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. So, you are on what street are you on? We teach. Um, well, we're across the earth. We're in the UK. We're in Jamaica. We're in Trinidad. We're in South America, Canada. Every damn near every state in the uh, United States and New York, we teach on 125th Street and uh, Lenox Ave. Okay, and yes, we were talking about earlier that you have Caucasians. Yeah, yeah sometimes. Bending yeah. down and kissing your feet. More than that, Caucasians are good prop tools. I was telling you about that too because our people don't believe nothing unless some white guy said it. <laughs> so when we confound that white guy, they, oh, they be. You got to see their face. It'd be amazing. We'd be out there saying, <laughs> Jesus is black. We the Israelites. God only loves blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians. And they fighting us. And then the white guy come. And when we confound him, then they'd be like, okay, they might make some sense. It's sad, but but true. But then we also have uh, white people that have remorse. And they'll feel sorry at what you could do. Or you can get on your knees and kiss the feet of these black men, your ancestors enslaved. And we do that, too. We have tons of videos on it. Texas is probably the number one spot. We call it boot kiss capital <laughs> is what we call it. I heard of that one. <laughs> yeah, we call it the boot kiss capital. I mean, but why, though? Why, why, why? You, do you have any white friends? I don't know if I would say I have white friends, but I, I'm around and interact with all races of people, not just white people. And I don't got to walk up to them. Like, it's not a personal thing. Like, when we talk about... Blacks in general. I'm not talking about every individual black person. If we're talking about white people, I'm not talking about every individual white person. So I can interact with white people and have conversations with them. When, when like Times Square, when we used to teach in Times Square, I used to talk to Officer Paul Spano every week. Like, hey man, y'all having any events out there? And have a cordial conversation with him. It's not personal like that to where we just walking around like you gonna die, and you know we doing that all day. We don't do that. The scriptures say be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. So it would defeat the purpose if we're out there uh, talking in that manner for no reason. Now, if anybody comes and is disrespectful, then we would deal with it accordingly. But if you're not being disrespectful to us, we won't be disrespectful to you. So you, <laughs> so you can, you can, oh, slow down. So you're not going to say you have white friends, but you can tolerate them. Yeah, I don't have no white friends. <laughs> no. Come on, Captain Zari. But like at a job, let's say if I'm at a job or something, somebody having a conversation with somebody doesn't make them a friend. Like I ain't inviting them to my home. They ain't coming to a party with me. I ain't hanging with them. I'm not doing that. Um, and even if you're doing that, if you had a party or something like that, that don't necessarily make them a friend. I think a friend would be more somebody you have a personal relationship with. Do you respect anybody that's white? In what in what manner do you do mean? Do you respect like? them? Do you respect any white person? Okay, so like if an officer comes up, I respect his position. He's the officer, so I'm going to talk to him and say, officer, you know, whatever your name is, like how I mentioned, Officer Spano. Yeah. So I respect his position, so I'm going to talk to him and have a regular conversation with him. Do you respect him as a man? I respect black men as men. No. And I think that they they're more so on a pedestal, but to respect them as a man, I mean, I don't, I think I were to me respecting them as an officer is the same thing as respecting them as a man. Why well, you can't just say you respect them as a man? Because I think they get enough respect from I, whom? From everybody, from the entire earth. Okay. There's nobody on the planet Earth that does not respect the white man. You know who's not respected? Black men, Hispanic men. Hispanic. We get treated like like you can. Kobe Bryant died. And Gail is running her mouth about him, about some fake rape charge he got years ago. You know why? Because even in death, the black man can't be respected. So I don't have to respect nobody but that black man. That black man deserves everything. He's like gold. You should wash his socks. You black women should love him to death and do whatever it is because you would not make it. There's no survival of the black community without the black man. Right. Now, so, so let's say um, you come across a white... Ca Caucasian guy who mm -hmm. who supports what you're doing and wants to get involved and you know you saying that the world gives him the utmost respect. Like how do you deal with that? If, if he can go to whatever bank he works at, <laughs> take all of it out and then put it at our door, <laughs> and then go about his way. 
<laughs> That's about the only thing he could I do like for that. us. <laughs> I want to be at your house. <laughs> there you go. That's the only thing he can do. But as far as yeah. being a part of uh, us, because you know what happens when he comes a part of us? It'll be just like we were talking about with that documentary where we're able to infiltrate and cause dissension. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The scriptures say for us, gather yourselves together, O nation, not desire. We're not desire. Right. Everybody wants to infiltrate us. One of my greatest yeah. examples I always use is the Negro League. The Negro League, I was just reading reading about this uh, for a lecture I got coming up. The Negro League was one of the most fantastic things black people had at a time. Because what that Negro League would do, it would allow that baseball team, could allow the popcorn man to have his business, the soda man to have his business, memorabilia. Everybody's having their business. And you know why it got destroyed? Because we wanted to hit the white baseball, and we wanted to let them in, and we allowed them to take our best players, the Jackie Robinson, the Satchel Pages, mm. the Josh Gibsons, to where you don't have a Kansas City Monarchs no more. And so now the Yankees, the same thing the Monarchs will have, the Yankees now feed their whole community with that. Economic politics So and we culture. cannot bring them into our organization because they'll automatically get on top of us because they're in a position of power we have the mysticism that we're in power when we're not. Mm. But you try to fight your black brother outside, uh, Brother Polite. <laughs> <laughs> you remember what I said earlier? I said, we won't be disrespectful. But if you're disrespectful to us, we do have a right to defend ourselves. I, I also made a statement to say we're not a respecter of persons. So I'm about brotherhood all day. But that don't mean that you get to disrespect me or threaten me with violence, and then I don't. I should have the right to defend that, of course, or at least call you out on that. Did I think he was going to do that that day? No, but I could not allow him to talk in the manner that he was talking. So we was able to push it, and then we squashed it a little bit after that. So I know that was there. Well, could I correct something? Sure. I didn't mention the book I was quoting, and it would be unfair to the answers. It's called the Pyramid Text. And it's chiseled in the tomb and stone of a tomb called the tomb of Unis. And it is it is the oldest written religious text known in the world. Um, Professor Smalls, you you sitting here, mm-hmm. you're telling me about a lot of things and where do you get <coughs> your information from? From God. Oops, I'm not That's okay. this thing again. Me and the Lord got a straight up hookup. Let me show you how. See, he thinks I'm kidding. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm listening to him. I'm sitting here, right? And you call me Professor Small. Yes, sir. I came into existence through the womb of my mom, right? That's right. And the only thing my mom got to bring into existence is the sperm of my daddy and the egg of her, which means I am my mother and my father. And if I take that cycle backwards, my first ancestor is God itself. And the only thing that has ever lived has been God, and we are nothing but, a, how do you say, we are just aspect of the divine essence having the human experience. And that's African culture I just laid out to you. And I did it backwards like that to make the point because the war between whites and blacks never, ever did have anything to do with color of skin. It had to do with concepts, ideas, and principles about the laws of nature and the laws of ecology and its relationship to humans and humans' relationship to it. If you stop the rhythm of the sun, we die. You interfere with gravity, we die. You don't drink water, you die. If the trees all stopped soaking up oxygen, we'd choke to death on our own carbon monoxide and died. So there's a relationship between everything and everything. And so I study books, books that's written by my ancestors. I listen to folklore, travel to Africa. I listen to oral traditions. And I'm from, you know, we've been in the United States now for about 500 years in this last incarnation, in this last large group. There was Africans here when the slave ships came here. And, but this, they, the, many of those brothers and sisters amalgamated with us, but a lot of them died 
from the white diseases that came because you didn't even have the common cold in this hemisphere before the white man. And it acted just like pneumonia on the people that lived here. But having been here, we have created a whole nother tribe and have created a whole nother amalgamation. And there's a history there. History is nothing but the experience of your ancestors and their relationship to God. That's what real history is. Okay? And their understanding and interpretation of the laws of the divine that they were trying to live by. So I'm a historian, and I've studied under Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Asa Hillier, Dr. Jeffrey, Ben Sedum. Those are my contemporaries, and so I had an opportunity that many generations didn't have to be with some dudes who were like really studying hard and heavy. So I could give you, I can at least give you a, a book list. I like to do that, you know. Um, I can have one sent to you that you can use on your program to make reference to what we were saying here tonight and give you about 10 good sources, both from the ancient scripture to contemporary scriptures. But, you know, when, when we asked you a question and you said, you know, um, you learn from God, can you see how yeah. some... Because I'm God having a human experience called me. Now, let me bring that. <laughs> I like this, brother. <laughs> He's cool. You know, I'm God having a human experience called me. And I, and I respect you, but can you see how that could be confusing to some of us? Well, let me break it down so nobody would be confused. When they go to bed at night, they don't have no nightmares and shit, right? I'm God having a human experience called me. Okay. And what that means is that each of us is an expression of an aspect of God's divine essence call us. If God is omnipotent, omnipresent, supreme, nothing else can exist but God, then what the hell are we? Ah, I got it. Except aspects of that divine existence. But each of us having our own peculiar experience. That's what my culture teaches me. So wait, you know? and you know, excuse me for being slow because you know, I'm, mm -hmm. sometimes I... I know. I'll be crazy sometimes. But I'll be do, like orbiting and you, stuff. But I'm, when it comes to the theory of God. I don't have a theory on God. No, but you believe there's a God. No, I know that I am God having a human oh, so experience called me. You think that. No, I'm not your God. There is only God. The, 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 there's a word in Ghana called Jinyami. Jinyami, okay. And what it means, nothing exists but God then you have to beg the question, what the hell is all the rest of this? I got wood, come from a tree, grow out of a ground, made of minerals that come from dead trees, dead bodies, dead animals. I get some charcoal, I got some dead bodies, dead animals, dead trees. I get some gold or diamond, I got dead animals, dead thing, dead tree compressed to the point over a long enough period of ground that we call it a diamond. Everything is everything. Sir, okay, but you what, know? I'm, what I'm asking you is this, are you, are you saying that we are God as far as the people, like we are our own, like we are. Each one of us, mm -hmm. since only God can exist. If anything else exists, then God ain't supreme. So I if God is the only thing that exists, we are no more than expressions of aspects of that divine existence. It's like the sun, right? It's a big ball of fire, but it sends out all of these particles and streams of light. Yet every particle and stream of light from, comes from the sun is different, but each one of them is an aspect of that sun that it emanated from. So where do you think the world come from? The world? Sun. See, and, and the language, as we speak, people talk about beginning and the end. There's no such concepts. There can be no such concept. Because even if we talk about this universe as far as we can see, what is beyond it? And even if he says something created the universe, what created the something which created the universe? Okay, I'm gonna really that. get real. So oh. we've created false <laughs> concepts to govern our own reality, like the beginning and the ending, the alpha and omega, that's ridiculous. There is no such concept as a beginning or an ending of anything because I am my mother and I am my father. And in being them, 
I am their parents, the four. And in being them, I am their parents, the eight. And being them, I am their parents, the 16. And being them, I am their parents, the 32. I am the sum total of them until I give birth to myself again. And they become the sum total of me and all of the rest of them. And if we take that backwards, you take it back to the first manifestation of the human being ever. And that manifestation have to come from the divinity itself. Mm -hmm. And if it comes from the divinity, then it is of the divinity. I gave for and in the pyramid text, Amun says, but you I gave birth to myself out of myself. I caused existence to exist so that existing might exist. And when I realized that I existed, truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, and reciprocity in the form of the feminine manifestation in nature, my art is standing at my side. So you didn't think like this when your parents had you as a kid. You didn't think like this, though. I was getting there. I left the church at about 16, and I started saying, like, this don't work quite right for me. But I found out, like, my brothers, a lot of the stuff that in the Bible that I rejected in the early years, mm -hmm. I realized that's solid African stuff, and it's solid law of nature. Matter of fact, the white man, when he did the translation, he might have messed up some stuff. He wasn't smart enough to hide the truth. He didn't know enough to mass the real deal. And whatever mistakes he made, there's enough there for us to override those mistakes. Hold this has our literature. Hold on, Professor Small. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to have a, a, a wonderful conversation, but <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you seem as confused as me a little bit. Um, you, when you were, where were you born? Jersey City. Jersey City. Mm -hmm. What house, what type of, what was, tell us about My house household. was, um, like, typical black household. Um, I grew up Christian household. Okay. Uh, my father was um, addicted to drugs, so he was, like, kind of, like, in and out. Um, so I grew up with my mom. Uh, got a twin sister and a young brother. And so I grew up in Roselle. I was born in Jersey City, lived in Roselle for a couple of years, and then I moved to yeah, Jersey City. No, not Roselle, Queen, Roselle, oh, okay. New Jersey. That looks like my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then I moved to Jersey City uh, in like 84. And then so I was in Jersey City from 84 to 99. And then I moved to uh, West Orange where I kind of live at uh, right now. So I grew up typical black household, Christian uh, doctrine, um, indoctrinated, you might as well say. Um, the close to militancy, like I was saying, was the Islam thing. Uh, but I never gravitated to that. Um, sold drugs for a little bit. Uh, joined the military to escape the, uh, what I thought was a drug. Then found out in the military you could sell more drugs than you could in the world. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> then I came home from there. <laughs> yeah, real talk. Then I came home from there. After that, I was doing security and bouncing. And then my grandfather, I was always good with computers and stuff. And so then my grandfather, the one, got me... Uh, this job at the Urban League, so I kind of been like IT since like ninety nine, ninety eight, like ninety eight, ninety nine. So, how did you with the Israelite stuff? Yeah, how did you get into that? But you said it earlier. Yeah, like Israelite but, stuff is like I was always reading the Bible, so like it was kind of easy for me to gravitate to the Israelite side. It was hard for me to be a Christian because I think Christians are soft. So it was hard for me to gravitate so to that. In what bay? In what that, bay? You know, turn the other cheek. You know, the concept we have of turn the other cheek is Martin Luther King. Exactly, mm -hmm. which is soft. So, and then you know, you got this white guy that you praying to. So, how does this savior look like the man that's killing you? Yeah. But when I would read the Bible, the Bible would reign true. But I would the images and the history of Christianity it would bother me. So when I found out that, um, and what's, what's funny, when I say found out, I used to always read, I read in the Bible where it des described Christ as having woolly hair, skin of bronze. But you, just like every Christian, you just overlap that because you've been flooded with the images mm -hmm. so long, you just accept the images over the truth. So when I started really taking it serious, 
And then looking at the archaeology, looking at the Renaissance era when they whitewashed all the images of a black Jesus, a black Moses, the black Israelites, and started turning them into Caesar Borgia, who the image that they say Jesus Christ is. So when I started going into it, it just made it easier. And then I could be militant. So I could be militant, love my people, teach the truth, have compassion. So being an Israelite just was comfortable. It was normal. So, but do you, so you believe in God? Absolutely. Okay. And who taught, okay, but who was your teacher? To, to learn the truth or you talk about when I was growing up? No, 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 no. The, to learn the truth, who was your teacher? Commander Jenny Hanna is my was my teacher, w one of my teachers. So we had okay. Commander Jenny Hanna, Jenny Mahayman, Jenny Mayak, all the teachers that are in um, ISVK. Those are who I would say is my teachers. And so I know, like when you say like who teaching you as a child, or how do you get the concept? It's almost like when you're a baby, you don't know nothing. You learn every a lot of things you learn through trial and error. <laughs> when you're riding a bike, you don't take that bike off the training wheels first. That bike is on training wheels. And so now you riding until you can learn the perfect balance to where you can take the training wheels off. Well, that's life. And for black people in America, that's our spirituality. You on training wheels when you're a Christian or a Muslim or any of those things. You got to learn to take the training wheels off so now you can ride it right so you can have your spirituality balanced to where now I ain't rode a bike in years. But if I get on that bike, I won't fall to the left or the right because I'm balanced. So that's how I am in the truth. So that's how it takes. And every black person wants to find God. Isn't it strange though, that mm. everybody have their own version of the truth? Yeah. That's not strange <clears throat> to you. No, it's to, for us, all that's like biblical prophecy. Like Romans 10 and one says, we have a zeal for the most high, but not according to knowledge. Black people, the most spiritual people. You're not going to find a more spiritual people than blacks and Hispanics. We going to gravitate to something. It doesn't matter what it is. It's rare that you have, a black atheist. But you, uh, oh, I, 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 I was gonna call my boy now, but I ain't uh, doing that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not getting in trouble with that. Yeah, that's one. rare. <laughs> that's but, but, but what I'm saying, mm -hmm. you see, like, and you kind of fasc fascinate me a little bit, pause, mm -hmm. because you you said earlier that you could differentiate, you differentiate, and that's why I'm learning. You differentiate right. the people. Right. You know what I mean, and usually when you're growing up, you want to consider or think that, you know, we are all one, you know, yeah. we're all one in the struggle. Yeah, and, Sesame Street, SpongeBob. You know, yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. No, no, no. Real talk, like, we're brought up in this but is God it, loves everybody, we all can be under one umbrella. But is it wrong to think that way? Is yes. Is it wrong to want peace? Is it wrong, no, is it but wrong you, to want to live peacefully? Is that wrong? It's not wrong to want to live peace, but you got to look at who's the ruler in Sesame Street, in our real Sesame Street. Okay. It's our oppressor. So now let's say if this oppressor or American society mm -hmm. was um, kind mm -hmm. to us. Okay. Then maybe there could be a benefit in living at peace. But you see how you desire to live at peace? Your desire of living at peace is getting along with everybody. America's desire of peace is bombing everybody first <laughs> and then say, I set what your peace is. Okay. I set how you rest, that's how it. you sleep, that's how you eat. That's yeah. every country. That's they fine. ain't just black people. They bomb Africa. They bomb the Middle East. They bomb any nation they want. Then afterwards, they got rations falling from the sky to feed the same people that they just dropped the bombs on the reason why they need the rations. So their form of peace is never going to be satisfactory to us. So we only accept Sesame Street because we ain't got no choice. Yeah. Or we believe we don't have no choice. Oh, yeah. okay. But if we gathered ourselves together, we would have that choice. What is your overall goal, though? What is your, what are you, what is, what is your goal? To convert people to... To wake everybody up to end uh, Bloods and Crips, to end MS-13s, to end the, gangs, yeah. the raping, to end child molestation, abortion, to eradicate everything that's plaguing black people. We 12% of the population, we number one in every death that you can think of. You don't believe in abortions? No. Mm -mm. Abortion murder. is murder. That's murder, bro. Yeah, abortion is murder. You if you don't want the you. baby, don't shoot the club. Yeah. Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, whoa. <laughs> 
Yo. 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 I mean, of course, you know, there's times where people just go in and shoot the club up, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? But there's also times where things happen. So in and those situations, then, 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 yeah, then the responsibility, responsibility should be had. Take if you're going to go inside of that woman or let that man go inside of you, then you know that there's a possibility you're going to get pregnant mm. or you're going to have a baby. So if you're not ready to go to that level, then don't do it. And that's why Africans put together the notion that we call family, you know? Family is an organization to take care of offsprings that comes from union, you know? And the family must be governed by something, and that's where the laws of God, the laws of the divine, the laws of nature come in. How do we govern our behavior? Or you can get some contraceptives or something. Use a condom or something. That's that's what what I'm saying. Like Sometimes those things pop, and then then what happens? The Lord be with you, brother. You got a kid on the way. If if it pops, you take the responsibility. You got to take the responsibility. The only reason you're sitting there is because someone took the responsibility. Now, if you take Otherwise, you'd have been a memory. If you take it off the individual perspective you know? and use big picture perspective, abortion is the number one killer of black people. It is. Straight like that. Since Margaret Sanger started the Negro Project, yeah. that's been the number one killer. I remember when I did the More research died on it from, from abortion last the, year than from AIDS and other that's diseases That's what I was just about combined. to say. If you combine from 1973 up until now, you combine AIDS, black on black crime, you lump every way to die, mm-hmm. it don't put a dent into what abortion does to oh, black man. people. So so sorry, sorry, yeah. mm-hmm. so so what do you think is a, is is the best way to solution. solution for this, you know what I'm saying? Like so every every, every what person. What we need what what blacks and Hispanics need is a moral compass. Like we don't have like we're the most social people on the planet, so ain't nobody gonna party or have fun like us. Mm-hmm. But if you don't put borders or hedges around that environment that's why we have so much promiscuity in young girls and young boys making mm-hmm. babies because there is no guidelines, there is no structure. Mm-hmm. Before that man lay with that woman, let that man talk to that man, that daughter, that, excuse me, that woman's father, the parents. Mm-hmm. Have a real order or structure. Maybe that father don't want his daughter to be with you. Maybe he has somebody else in mind. Maybe she ain't ready. Right. Maybe the, maybe the, fa- the son's parents will tell him he's not ready. Like, we should lay out, we should have a direct responsibility of when our children do decide to be intimate with each other. Well, let, let me help other. with that, mm-hmm. brother. Look at the communities that have successful community organizations from the European Jews to the Chinese to the Japanese. And you know what they do? They fulfill what he just said as a part of how that community is structured. Mm. Okay, And so they have order. And they have relationship, and they don't have all of the crises we have. They're not suffering from the death thralls we are suffering from because they have these things in place, these rules in place, these principles that govern their behavior in place. And thus, being organized by those things, they can produce the economic politics and culture that will give them the stability when that crisis does happen, if it happens. Mm-hmm. But when the crisis happened for us, we can't even afford the sneakers we're wearing, let <laughs> alone the rent and the baby food and the pampers. You know what I'm saying? But, so what we were talking about initially about the um, theological system or religious system or spiritual system, which is a set of rules that govern human character right. and our behavior. In order for us to build the societies we live in, to do what? To bring forth our offsprings to give them an existence when our existence no longer exists. Mm -hmm. That's what this whole thing is about. And it's nothing confusing about it. So if they can't take up the responsibility, what do you suggest them to do? If you can, I mean, worst case scenario, I mean, you can get counseled. Like in our school, we'll take your baby. Yeah. Oh, for real? We'll raise the baby. I told all of my children when they were in college and stuff, it's like, don't bring no abortion to my house. Let me know you're pregnant, and I will take that child. Yeah. Wow. And I will raise them just like I raised y'all. Yeah, we, we'll take the responsibility. I'd rather do that than have you yeah. 
killing another black child. I think because we got enough when black you kids. see the genius that walk among us every day, imagine how many of those genius got flushed down a toilet. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> this, this let, me, let me let me ask you a question. You know, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up soon. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? I'm start with you. What do mm -hmm. you think a woman's role should be? A woman's role should be in the support of her husband. Get a little bit deeper because I don't meaning like okay, so like for Israelites, we teach the head of every woman is the man. Well, let's say if the woman's not married. <laughs> yeah. You're always messing with yeah. 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 It's real like talk, back though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm going to tell you, the worst thing that they could have... Uh, I am. The worst thing they could they could have ever done was destroy the black household. And when you take a black man out of his position of power in that household is how you have the feminist movement able to invade. Look at life, look at the statistics of the black household in the 60s. In the 60s, we was turning the corner as being the number one household in America, the number one. And then what they started to do after Malcolm is gone and then after Martin is gone, then they flood us with the drugs, then they start pushing the black man out the house and then they create the feminist movement to where they'll tell the black woman that they'll give her help, but the black man can't be in the household. Mm -hmm. So now the black man is now out of the household. Where's the, where's the protector at? The protector, the provider, the guider, the one that gives instructions. So now you got the black woman, and what is she going to think in that whole time? She's just going to think survival. So now she creates a bunch of docile young black men because the father's not around, and then at the same time beats down the father. Whereas if the father was in the house as the protector. Now, when I'm saying the black woman backs the black man up, I'm not diminishing her power. There ain't a greater thing on the face of the planet than a black woman. That's biblical, what I just said. Mm -hmm. The only thing stronger than a woman is God. That's biblical, what I just said. But now, if there ain't no protector for her to protect Jeez. her, then what does she have? Nothing. So I'm not saying that she can't have a better job, she can't be more financially stable. Not I'm not saying that. that, but what I am saying is that her head is her husband. The two become one flesh. They become united, not divided. When you look at the black household today, it's a financial competition or it's a beat down the black man competition where if we had a perfect order, then it would be fine. So her role is in support of her man. So there is a such thing as a strong black woman, yes? That's a detriment to her. The independent woman, right? Remember Sybil had that song in the 80s, I'm independent? Beyonce had that yeah, song, yes, Independent? Yes, yes. The white woman ain't got no independent song. The Japanese, the Arab, they don't have that. You know what they do? They stand by their man. Mm -hmm. They taught the black woman to not stand by her mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. so that they can seduce her, so that they can get rid of her. Man, so that they can no devalue the black man. The media. You, you, no. you, you believe in that too, uh, Professor Small? I may have a little more variance, but I believe 90% in that. See, I believe in the laws of God. I am the sun. I give off a light, and my woman is the moon. She reflects that light onto my children. Oh, no, so, I, I never heard that before. That, that's, heard because, that. that's why history will erase the mystery. That's why in ancient Kemet, they got a dude, they call her Sar, who's the sun, and they got a woman, they call her Set, who's the moon. Then they got a child, call her Ru, who's the offspring, who's the hero that's going to be the savior because he's the part of that perfect balance and harmony in the universe. Um, I have eight children, six genetic, two adopted, and they are the satellites that swing around the sun and the moon that me and my wife represent. Mm -hmm. And they will become moons and suns, and they will create satellites as we imitate the cosmology and the ecology mm -hmm. that the divine has given us to mimic <coughs> in our attempt to be perfection, you know? The woman is power. When you understand that Nurturing the offspring of the man and woman into that most sacred space between birth and the time they're about 10, that's primarily the woman. She is the creator of the mental 
status of the next generation. She can't do that if she's out there like the European woman who's playing the European man, you know? That being a, a female does not diminish you. Mm-hmm. Being a male right. does not diminish you. You have roles in nature. I can let my baby nurse on my titty all I want, but he ain't getting shit up out of there, all right? He got to nurse his mama's breasts. Mm-hmm. He's going to get nourishment and nutrients out of there. That's real. We have functions in nature. And when we are doing the appropriate function to create the harmony and balance, we have a whole healthy, optimal unit at work. And then you keep imitating that unit. You know, you create a man and a woman built from the appropriate quality attributes and role in terms of how a family is formed. So when you bring the children in, you then replicate yourself. And you replicate the wisdom of your ancestors, which is the wisdom of the divine itself. But somebody has interrupted that process. They've given us a model for how we should behave, which is a model that has led us to self-destruction. Mm-hmm. You know? We're one of them, we, even with our shattered consciousness, as Dr. Noble said, and broken black identity, we're still the most powerful thing on the planet. Mm-hmm. Think if we can hook ourselves up in the manner that the captain just said, where we organize around concept, principles, ideas, ethical, moral standings that would be appropriate to create the healthy or the optimally healthy family, how powerful then we would be. We will rule the world again, and until we rule the world again, there will be no peace in the world. All right. Respect that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Final question for you. Um, wait, wait, hold on. So, Dad, get at you, man. Man, no problem. <laughs> you, just, you just can't be saying stuff like that. That's nice. <laughs> so, so <laughs> gee, chill. Drop G- some jewels on him, brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Smalls. But I got I to gotta talk to this guy, man. Mm. So, if a woman is is strong, right, it's and, and independent, is it's, it's a detriment to her, you said. Yeah, if her strength or independence is without the man that she's with, it is a detriment. So what what about the men that leave the women stranded? What do you say about that? They what should, a, what, what you should the, like like that I would say I would be against them too. Like a man and woman when you're joined together, you're not joined together to be apart. You're joined together to be together. So I've you been gonna, married 50 years, brother. Yeah, I got I got a couple of watch. I've got 20 years is my longest. And so you got a couple what? Sorry. Uh, wives. Uh, a couple. Uh, but 20 all, years ago. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, I, I was going to ask him that too. I didn't really mean to say I guess that. What's, what's the status? So you didn't really mean to say that. So you, wanted, yeah. you, you, wanted, you wanted to censor that. No, right? I, not, I, didn't, I don't mind saying it. I don't want to say it like that. But I knew once I said it, I knew what you was going to. You don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no sweat. No sweat. So, so, wait, 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 wait. So, G, actually, is he with what? G, don't see him here, G. So you, got, you got a couple of wives. I have a few. Yeah, I have a few. Mm-hmm. Currently. Currently, yeah. God bless you, son. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hmm. so, uh, so, how do you protect the couple of wives? You know, because it's you protect them all. Hmm. What do you mean, protect them like by being there, or protect them? I mean, because you know, guidance just, and just, direction. I mean, just, just just speaking with you today, you know, you kind of mentioned. Well, you you not kind of you mm-hmm. did mention about the man and the woman and the household right. and you know the guy being in the head and mm-hmm. but you know you didn't mention anything about having multiple wives. So, Facts. So, right. so how do you... Ha- to let that slide. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so how do you manage that? Yeah. I manage it I manage it just fine, perfectly, actually. It's not so that what's hard that, at what's all. That, what's that living... What's that called? Uh, polygamy? Yeah, well, that's, that's like the American definition. term. Yeah, it's the American yeah. term. Got it, got it. Um, but you don't believe in that. You don't believe in polygamy. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the term. It's, a, it's just a definition. But you're not... You're not Married to them on paper, are you? No, not okay. just one, just one. Because yeah, on you paper. couldn't, it wouldn't. But be for us, like when we say married, which I was gonna go back to uh, when I was saying before, when you lay with a woman, that's your wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now blow your mind. Now yeah. let's blow your mind. Now he got a lot of wives. Yeah, now, 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 now,
very I'm very wise. Yeah. Hey, G, what else you got, G? Yo, so like, he's a small. He's a small. Yeah, yeah. See, like, talk that. So like the way the way we teach. Remember, I was remember we was talking about the promiscuity and stuff like that, having a moral compass. So now imagine if we was brought up knowing that the man that you lay with is the last man that you can lay with. Or that woman that you lay with, you have to keep her for the rest of your life. There wouldn't be too many one night stands no more because you gotta keep that woman. But that let's you, take it back in the history and time and the science. Even today, birth of female to male is three to one. Okay. I mean there's three women born healthy to everyone healthy male. Understood. Now what are you gonna do with the mother two women? <laughs> Gotta do something for them. Like Captain <laughs> Cesario. That's yeah, why we man. invented polygamy do? to keep the harmony and the balance. Yeah, we're in just the trying to balance it out. So, nope. you know, <laughs> I I why can't so, live, you know? So, I respect the in, in running the household, running the household is not just, you know, you're not always there physically. I'm not at nobody's house mm -hmm. right now, but you can give them guidance and instruction and put a hedge around them to where they are protected. So, I'm, I'm able to do that in all my households. And it's a family relationship, mm -hmm. you know. Wait, wait, time out. So, oh, oh, Professor Small, stop backing him up, man. <laughs> if, it's, if it's the truth, it's the truth. I, 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 so, I mean. so hold on. You uh, are they aware of each other? Absolutely. I don't lie. What, um, only men that lie are afraid of their woman. Mm. I don't have to lie. That sounds kind of deep. I'm not afraid of my women, so I don't have to lie. You have I, more than two. Yeah. More than four? I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tell. I usually don't tell. I keep that part What's of that. that? Oh. I just have that private. I just have a couple. Pardon me. Okay. Do you plan yeah, on adding any more? No, nah, I think I'm retired. <laughs> for the Do you most have part. any children? I have five. God bless you. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I'm, let me be fair. I have eight. Because I have some that are not biologically That mine. you brought into your right. family. Mm -hmm. Respect. And. Just one last question because we got to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have family dinners and stuff like that? Is it like, like that? Like all together? Yeah. No, nah, not necessarily. Oh, no. so you don't got it like that? No, no, it ain't that. It ain't. <laughs> I got to get. So you go ahead, nah. You don't mean letting it hang to Zari. Nah, know. I am letting it hang now. Don't get it uh, twisted. You let everything but. hang. Just that. <laughs> <laughs> I was riding with you, man. No, nah, I don't. Okay, so like in, like the polygamous, like when you think of the American way, you think of like big love, a big house, where everybody's yes, in the I same think, house. Yeah. But you don't have to have them in the same house. Okay. I wouldn't have that much estrogen together. Like I that. understand. I got what but you're what saying. But what they do do, all my kids. You know, they interact with each other. They all know each yeah. other and stuff like that. Like, they'll pick the other, you know, pick my kids. I don't have to. Sometimes I can't pick the kids up. So they'll go pick the kids up and bring them back. So it is harmonious. Mm -hmm. But they don't have to necessarily be together all the time. But if they wanted to, they can. But it's not a commandment that they have to be together like that. Man, okay. man listen, you know, if, if you got a class that teaches this type of stuff. I did I'm, a lecture I'm, I'm called taking, How to Share Your Man. I did a lecture on it. All right. How to I'm, share I'm, your I'm man. I'm taking that class. Yeah, yeah. Chill, leave that, stay away from me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a life, that's a different kind of lifestyle, man. Yeah, <laughs> man, but it's a responsible one too because you can't get rid of them. So mm. any new woman you sleep with, they belong to you. That's a wrap. That's your woman, and you should say it just like that so they can know that mm -hmm. if I do this with you, then you can't go. You don't want to trick them. You know, you just get them in the bed, and then you, after you have the action, you say, "Yeah, you my wife. You can't go nowhere." They might not have wanted to sleep with you if they knew that. Got you. So you want to be honest. You want to be upfront. You want to be a just man. Last question. The uh, ISUPK. Mm -hmm. What programs do you have in place? We have a, a rehab program. If you come to our school, uh, 2279 Third uh, Ave in Harlem, New York. We have a GED program. We have a rehab program. Um, we have a prison program, which they be fighting us all the time. But we have a prison program as well where we'll come to the prison. Like, I've been to Clinton uh, Prison. I've taught up there. We used to teach in uh, uh, prison in PA. So we have those programs. We have a food drive that we do when we out at camp on 125th Street. We have a food drive right there where we give out food uh, to the homeless and stuff like that. Anybody have any food they want to donate, they could bring it to our school. So those are the programs that we have in place. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. If I could plug my radio show, we do plug a radio show every yeah, Thursday. Sure. Uh, on uh, we have a YouTube channel, Cross the Line Radio is the YouTube channel. Every Thursday we uh, do a live YouTube channel. Anybody want to be a guest, you can contact us. 
What about you, Professor? I do have to drop the thing. I think it's March 21st um, with King Simon. So get in touch with King Simon Production. The Brother Small is going to drop two days of spiritual science on you. But for me, you know, I'm a businessman. I have a... We uh, can uh, tell. Yeah. <laughs> I have a hotel with a group of other comrades in Ghana. I'm the CEO for 15 years, Sana Lodge. We have the largest African-American-owned business in Ghana. And I'm the CEO of the corporation, the African-American management company, Ghana Limited. I have a travel organization along with my Hebrew sister, <laughs> Sister Martha Leah Williams, and they call Cultural Heritage African Tours. You can look it up. We do tours to Africa two, three times a year. Um, and I'm just being a grandfather. I got 26 grandkids, mm. wow, you know congrats. what I'm saying? Um, I have two children in Ghana, and I have six children here. And one of my daughters in Ghana, she is um, a member of parliament and the minister of lands and resources in the government of Ghana. So, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, I'll be leaving for Ghana on Thursday, um, I'll be able to try to negotiate a merger with a Ghanaian hotel, a larger firm, mm -hmm. and our smaller 30 room hotel, so that we can, you know, step into the future. By June, we should be back up and running as a, a three star deluxe. Um, and just trying to create that unity between the Africans in the diaspora and the ones at home. So this is not just a hotel, it's kind of a hotel, uh, educational center, museum, um, but it's a place where we come together. And the name is Sana, the Sana Lodge. And the word itself means the place of wealth, a place from which one does not depart until the task is complete. Mm. <coughs> Oh, Sana, Sana, you... Tell them your PayPal email in case anybody would like to donate to the hotel. Where you at? Oh, yeah. My PayPal email is C small, C S M A L L 1926 at AOL.com. So you can see I'm old school. What's it, what, 1926? Mm -hmm. The year you was born? Nah, I'm just no, kidding. I got angry with Explain PayPal you. once and I closed it arbitrarily. So I went away and I needed to get some email and I was in Africa. So I told my son, Redo my email, and the only year he could find was 1926. I know, I'm so, uh, C small 1926 at AOL.com. Is there anything that you guys want to say from Sarnetta? Anybody in here that you that you didn't get to mention? Uh, anything because sometimes, a lot of times, you know, when people <laughs> leave the platform, uh, people are like, Oh, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention that. So, is there anything right. that you want to mention that you didn't? No, I don't think I did it all. Uh, we do have a Passover, we celebrate, um, a lot of people celebrate that Easter with bunnies or whatever, like that. Mm. We celebrate, um, the Lord's Passover April 9th at the Westchester County Center. Okay, we celebrate that, uh, April 9th. Any black, Hispanic, or Native Indian, you know, you're more than welcome to come. Caucasians are not, uh, no, no, so wait, time out. Nah. If I bring up white friend, I have that. I have nah. to, you're, gonna, you're not going to let them in. Nah. No plus one for hey, you. Hold on. Nah. You're going to yeah. put them out. <laughs> they won't get through the door. That's right. not true. I don't think. <laughs> really? I'll tell you what. Do it. No. Do it. Why? Don't <laughs> tell me. I'm doing real. I, but why I would you do that, man? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was so That's cool. exclusive, man. We're special. We got to have it for we got to have it for ourselves. Y'all celebrate Kwanzaa? I don't. I mean, no, he, I don't celebrate do. See, that. They, it, listen, sometimes we need things that we can call our own. Right. And you so know, that's just our like own. Europeans, they got stuff where you won't be able to participate. That's you true. Won't be able yeah. To they can have a Fourth of July. I don't celebrate that. They can have it. What holidays do you guys celebrate? Like the Passover is our holiday, or no? Not that 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 might be celebrated as well. Oh, none. 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 <laughs> New Year. Nah, you can't no. have the new year in the dead of winter. Animals could teach you the new year is in the spring. Mm -hmm. The trees die in the fall. Mm -hmm. They oh. come back to life in the spring. The laws of nature. Even that the could laws teach of you. Cosmology and ecology. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so. We don't teach nothing. Yeah, let, yeah. let me tell you, I was a Muslim <laughs> imam, and there's a prayer. It's called Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kul hu Allah ahad. Allah hu samad. Balem yulid, balem yulad, balem yukupu. One ahad. Allah hu akbar. It says, Know ye that God is one, begeth none, nor is begotten by none. Everything is just one. You ever see the little kids go like, one African? It's just one. 
It is the divine. And we are nothing more than sprinkle of the light from that God. Yeah, yeah cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's cool, dude. Because I like cool. my younger brother. <laughs> you know, Yo, I really like, appreciate you. Hey, no sweat. Any final words, G? Nah, that's good, man. Yeah. Listen, we appreciate you guys. Nah, anytime, Sanetta. man. Thank I appreciate you, you having me on. I Thank appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Sanetta, you have an event coming up that you try to yes, trick March, me into coming? March the, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, March the 22nd, I'll be, um, there, it's uh, called the Double Impact Debate. So I'll be doing a debate that day against uh, Dr. Vincent Bantu. He's a college professor. Okay. The subject of that debate is Christianity good for our people. Mm -hmm. Subplot is, um, is Christianity the white man's religion. Okay. And then after that debate, you have uh, Jabari versus Garfield. Their subject is Christianity copy from Kemet. So mm -hmm. that's March the 22nd at St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York. Nice. Yeah. Double okay. Impact. Double, Double impact. impact. And what Garfield, brother Garfield that was here? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother Jabari, man. Yeah. yeah. One let, of the top scholars in our community. Let me do this piece again with King Simon. See, I'm speaking so much. I'm going to be in Cincinnati on the 22nd. <laughs> so this is April 16th. Um, and I'm going to be doing a piece on the African spirituality connection and application. And I want to see where we are. I think it's at St. Francis. No, King's. Well, just go to King Simon Production. Okay. And it'll hook you up. But it's definitely April 18th. And if you want me to see you, teach you how to walk on water and how spirituality <laughs> is your reality, you'll come to this one. See, because people think spirituality is a bucket of water side of the road. You just go pick it up. Oh, I'm going to get my spirituality together. No. Spirituality is your reality and how you manage it. You and know? you said in history they try to erase. How it goes again? History will erase, erase the mystery history. and allow you to work your magic. That's why he was cool. You understand now? <laughs> I waited for long enough, yeah. man. Yeah, <laughs> Yo, we out of here, man. Um. Make sure you follow the pages, platforms, and all that. At Flip the Script Pod, at DJG1156, at Queens Flip with a Z. Um, Y'all keep supporting the video, too. I have the new record on my, on my Instagram page. The, the link is in my bio. Um, Shout out Fancy the Flair, you know what I'm saying? Pick within 2020. Real hip hop, real bars, you know what I'm saying? Um, I plan to drop something else this month, too, for February, so look out for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make sure you follow my brother Sarnetta at uh, Sarnetta <laughs> Studios. Facts. Yeah, YouTube.com, Sarnetta Studios. You. Um, you know, he calls me and he got this funny voice. Yo, Flip, man, we got to, like, yo, Sarnetta, <laughs> leave me alone. Shout out to the brother, Sarnetta, though. I really appreciate nah, you. Thanks, sir, sir. Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, remember, man, you know, we, we here at Queen Flip, URLTV.TV. I'm here. Remember, lock your doors, close your windows, close your blinds, open your blinds. If you see Brother Smalls on your lawn, let him in. He don't mean no harm. But if you see Zari on your lawn, don't be afraid to use a firearm. I'm from Queens. <laughs>